Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. With me tonight in the Select Board Chambers are John Hurd, Diane Mahan, Eric Helmuth, Doug Heim, Town Council, Ashley Marslock, Board Manager. Mr. Diggins, if you can hear us, if you can uh, respond in the affirmative. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chapter Lane, um, could you also uh, respond in the affirmative if you can hear us? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you. Uh, tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with an act signed into law on February 15th, 2022 that extends certain COVID-19 related measures. The act includes an extension until July 15th, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Once again, we have a full agenda, so let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. I'll now move to the next item on the agenda, item two, discussion and approval. Arlington Community Electric Electricity Program <coughs> Default Renewable Rate, uh, Talia Fox, sustain Sustainability Manager, and uh, Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So while Talia is joining the meeting, I will just uh, briefly say that Talia is gonna run through a presentation on this program. And ultimately what we'll be asking for is the boards authorization for myself working with Talia and our energy broker, Good Energy, to uh, establish a default rate and thereby then execute a contract for the next aggregation. But with that said, I see Talia on the screen so she can go ahead and share her screen and um, run through a presentation and then we'll both be happy to answer the board's questions. Great, thank you. Good evening, Ms. Fox, sorry on the pronunciation. Nice to see you, Talia. Nice to see you, thank you so much. I will just share my screen right now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Good evening, my name is Talia Fox and I am Arlington's new sustainability manager. And it's a pleasure to meet all of, all of you who I have not yet met. I will be presenting briefly on the context for the upcoming contract renewal for the Arlington Community Electricity Program and the opportunity to increase the default level of renewable energy. And as the town manager said, following the presentation, we will ask the select board to discuss that target percentage. So you may know that the town is required to pay for electricity distribution through our utility Eversource, but we can choose to purchase electricity supply from competitive suppliers. Arlington Community Electricity or ACE was launched in 2017. It is a town vetted municipal aggregation program enabled by state law that allows us to purchase electricity supply in bulk. This has several benefits, including environmental impact, because ACE enables us to purchase clean electricity like wind and solar beyond state requirements. Stability, because ACE rates are fixed for the contract duration, typically two to three years, while utility rates fluctuate with the market. Competitive rates, which have resulted in significant savings over the life of the program previously, future savings cannot be guaranteed, Consumer choice by offering program options with different levels of, of additional renewables, 
and continuity, and that discounts for income qualified customers and net metering benefits for solar generators are unaffected. This graph uh, shows rates of the ACE default or local green option compared to Eversource residential rates over the lifetime of the program. The blue line is the Eversource rate, which you can see has changed every six months. The green line is the ACE rate over time, which was, has remained consistent. And this consistency has resulted in approximately $2.3 million of savings since 2017 when the program began. This next slide lists the four products that ACE currently offers. Three of the products offer more renewable energy than what is required by the state, layered on top of a basic product that meets state requirements. That additional renewable energy is represented here by the green bars. This first product, the local green option on the left, is the default option. Anyone who opens an electricity account in Arlington will automatically be enrolled in this option, which offers 11% more renewable energy than what the state requires. The customer can then choose to pay for more renewables through the 50% or 100% options, or opt down to a fourth basic option, which simply meets state requirements and is the cheapest of the four options. All of the additional renewables are categorized by the state as Massachusetts class one renewables from local solar, wind, anaerobic digestion, and low impact hydropower sources. On this next slide, I want to emphasize some of the program successes. We have very high participation, about 16,000 accounts or about 75% of all accounts in town. And many people have opted up to the 100% and 50% options, about 1,100 in total as of January. And this is due to the success of our opt-up campaign led by community volunteers, which has encouraged a 60% increase in opt-ups compared to our last contract. And as I mentioned, the cumulative savings through the program are significant, a total of $2.3 million, which is on average about $153 per account. The environmental impact is also significant. Customers have purchased more than 15.1 million kilowatt hours of additional renewable energy enough to power 2,600 average Arlington homes on renewables. Here, I'd like to offer some considerations for the upcoming contract renewal. Our current contract expires at the end of November of this year, and we are in conversations with our consultant around the upcoming bidding process. We expect to sign a contract in April or May. After the bid, we will come back to the select board for approval and the town manager will sign a new contract. We have the opportunity to select a default rate of renewable energy that is higher than that current 11% default rate that I mentioned. And the net zero action plan, which the select board endorsed in 2021, advises the town to exceed the current 11% default for the upcoming contract and achieve 100% renewables in the ACE default in total by 2030. For comparison, our current 11% default level yields a total of 31% renewables consisting of the 11% on top of the 20% state required renewables. So we have a bit of a ways to go to get to our 100% goal. Fortunately, we will have at least two additional contracts to raise the default level prior to 2030, as these contracts have typically lasted, as I mentioned, two to three years each. I wanna note that the market, as we know, is volatile right now due to the global pandemic and due to geopolitical conflict. So it is likely that the cost of that ACE basic product will increase in the, next, in the next contract. As a reminder, that ACE basic product is that lowest cost option for our program that I showed before with that, the 0% additional renewables. Unfortunately, we cannot estimate what this cost will be given how volatile the market is. But what we can say is that this rate will be competitive with the utilities rates. And we can estimate the cost of the additional renewables in the default, the 50% and the 100% products that I also reviewed before, which are layered on top of that ACE basic product. Right now, for example, our current 11% ACE default costs the average residential participant an additional $19 per year on top of the average cost of electricity, which right now is about $600 per year for the average residential customer. And estimates for our upcoming contract indicate that every additional 5% of renewable energy adds around 10%, or excuse me, $10 per user per year. And I'll talk about these uh, cost estimates in more detail on this next slide. So to inform our discussion of the default rate right now, this slide shows cost estimates for the upcoming contract for only the additional portion of renewables. 
So these figures are the additional amount above what a participant would pay if enrolled in just that ACE basic product, the cheapest option, competitive with utilities rates that all participants could opt down to at any time. <coughs> the first column here is the percentage of additional renewables. Right now, again, we're at 11% for our default. So this table is showing options ranging from 15% to 35% just for discussion purposes. That second, second column is what the user would pay on top of the ACE basic option. And the last two columns are the total amount of renewables factoring in state requirements in 2025, which is likely around when our next contract would end, and 2030, which is when we need to meet our 100% renewable goal. And what I flagged here are two potential options just for our discussion purposes. A 20% default level in that first column would yield a total of 60% renewables by 2030. And we'd be about a third of the way to our 100% goal because we'd have two more contracts to increase the default level by 20% each. A 30% default level now in the first column would yield a total of 70% renewables by 2030. So we'd be halfway to our goal and would have two more contracts to make up the remaining 30%. Last, I'll just note that it's also possible, but not guaranteed, that we could see additional increases in the state requirements, which would increase the totals in that, the last columns here. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and turn it back over to Adam. We also, I believe, have our consultant on the line to answer any questions. And I thank you all for your time and I look forward to this discussion tonight. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Fox. Mr. <coughs> Chapter Lane, would uh, you like to add anything? Uh, no, I, I have nothing to add to that excellent presentation, but happy to answer questions. And I know as I discussed with the chair prior, I, I do think there's members of the public who may have comment and question as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll turn to the board if there's any questions now, and then we'll hear from the public and then um, see if we can um, have a vote uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, Mr. Hellman? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation for your good work. Um, can you help us understand you know, I, I pre the table of, of potential costs with the percentage increases is very helpful. Can you put that in context with uh, what we think the market rates will be? And, you know, well, I guess what I'm looking for is do you have, I know that the, this is speculation, you know, that this is, there are no guarantees in this market for the RECs, but um, where do you think our extra class percentage target would be your best guess to where you know to where that that would be put us at parity with where the market rates are, so that we're it wouldn't be necessarily costing consumers more than if they weren't in ACE at all. So I talk, do you, go ahead if you want to take a crack, Talia. So I I would actually defer specific questions on market rates if if Patrick uh, from Good Energy, our consultant, is on the line. I just think he will be able to speak a little bit more specifically to those estimates. As far as I understand from him, we we can't actually uh, know specifically what the market rates will be, but I think Patrick might be able to say a bit more here. So uh, yes, uh, hello. Um, hello. This is Patrick. Hi, uh, Patrick. Good evening. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, to, I think Talia laid it out well. Um, so we've been working as the town's consultant since the, the program launched. And um, effectively, every time we're going out to bid, we're sort of working in, in whatever the market conditions are at that time and um, looking to, to strike at an optimal, an optimal time and, and lock in you know, a, a, a fixed price that's, that's stable. and. Um, and that we believe will have savings. But as Talia noted, we, uh, because the utilities set their rates every six months, um, things can really change a lot in each six month period. And as you saw in that chart, that's why we, we have that, that variability up and down. So, you know, I think if you had looked back over the previous contract, um, the, this, this current one that we're in right now, the, the ACE basic product is saving your, um, your average uh, user, something like $45 a year. And as Talia noted, um, those extra renewables right now are costing around 19 or, or $20. So you get a sense that we're, you know, you're paying, we're, we're overall coming out, coming out ahead. Um, we, and we just, we're, we're not unfortunately in the business of forecasting the, the future rates. If we, we did, it's kind of like the stock market, you know, if we knew exactly where it was going to head, we'd be, um, 
we'd be probably on a beach somewhere. Uh, so I think the what we've found is you know your um, your 11% rate today is is at a, a rate that's that was been sort of a high degree of likelihood you know of of being uh, lower than the utility still, and you, the, the the more you in, increase that the the, the I, guess, I think it's more about sort of the probability that you may end up end up paying paying more. So um, I think moving to something we I think we would say moving to something like you know that twenty percent rate that, that Talia mentioned would I think would still keep you in a in a pretty good probability of of um, of having of having savings if you were you know looking at um, maybe above the thirty percent that might be a little bit more on the on the edge there. That's that's actually really helpful given the uncertainties in the market. Do you think that you know if I were to ask you um, again your your best projection you know we know you're not in the fortune telling business. Um, what our our best shot at if we wanted to break even? Supposing our priority was to say um, that we want to keep it competitive, not necessarily be be less expensive than market, but but for the sake of of the climate, you know, trying to trying to really maximize that. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned twenty percent on one end and thirty percent on the other end. Would twenty five percent be a reasonable uh, ballpark if we if we wanted to try to keep it about break even? I have to say I'm I'm hesitant to to add that's fair to, to add that yeah and, <laughs> but but if I could I think that you know Talia laid out the benefits of these, this program really well and particularly as we move into an era of increasing volatility and I and I think we're seeing what, you know there are as Talia mentioned the geopolitical um, issues happening out which are yeah. part of that volatility but another I think we really think that that volatility. It has it has definitely increased since the program you know initially started, and we think that's really here to stay, largely because the world is going through an energy transition. You know, uh, decarbonization efforts are, are really ramping up around the world, um, and that itself, you know, th these types of major transitions themselves have volatility as we take you know major steps forward and sort of backwards here and there. Um, and and the other thing is natural gas now in in, in New England. In the winter, we get the sort of the, the last bit of natural gas we need from liquid natural gas that's shipped in, and because we're constrained on the pipeline. And what that means is that those ships can go to really any port around the world. And so we're now competing in a global market for natural gas. Um, so uh, there are a few of these factors that suggest the volatility is here to stay. And I think that really underscores the value of these programs in in providing a fixed and you know stable price through that, even if maybe it's a little bit higher on average or, or it's a little lower, if it doesn't quite hit that mark, yeah. we've still I think yeah had that that stability. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, and and I you know I know I've been trying to pin you down on something that can't be, but I think what's been useful to me is your answers to those impossible questions. Um, because I think it provides some of the context um, and, and the way we need to think about it. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Taylor. And, and Patrick, just for the record, if you could tell us your last name. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, Patrick Roach. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Mrs. Mahan? Um, few of my questions really um, Mr. Helmuth covered, so I'm going to try not to re-ask them. Um, but we're talking about this right now and um, talking about establishing a default rate. Did I read the materials correctly that we have another one or two opportunities where we can revisit the default rate before 2030? Correct. So we, we end up executing contracts um, for the best price and getting the best price means sometimes the duration varies. So the first contract was about two years. This most recent contract, I believe, was 33 months or 34 months. So that will play out when we get bids in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but the overall point is that somewhere within that two or three year time frame means we probably will do this, including this time, three more times before we get to 2030. Okay. And the reason I'm kind of putting that into play of, of my thinking is um, not really sure, just reading um, my limited financial expertise um, 
in terms of uh, the economy. I won't even go into stocks and, and everything like that, but um, I, I'd like to do this. Where I'm coming from is that we start off incrementally slow, slower, slowly, not slower, slowly understanding that, you know, unlike when we were stuck in Neswick or the NIPTES variants, it's a 15 year decision and you're stuck. Um, and uh, I understand, I guess the only question I'll repeat that Mr. Helmuth um, has, so, has already asked is where you factor in there, I think it said something um, every 5% or 10%, is it every five or 10% is about, you have in the materials a $10 per, per year projection. So is, is that five or 10? percent is an estimated ten dollars per year and am I hearing that I really can't um, hang my hat on that because the, um, you're, you're saying I don't want to say you have no idea but I mean, I would, yeah, go ahead Mr. Chapterline I, I think yep. this is like the, the difficulty in predicting what's going to happen <laughs> in the future because no no well they put it in there yeah, so yeah, no, go ahead. Yep. If, if it's in there and, and you're asking me to make a decision if it's just kind of baseless and, and you just tell me don't use that, then I won't use that. But, um, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic or anything, but um, you know, I, I look at the information provided. I'd like to get to the, the maximum that we can, but also recognizing you know, the, the times that we're in. So that what was provided, should I hang my hat on that at all or no, just throw that out the window. That's not something that's really valid. It's just in there. Well, I would say, and certainly Talia and Patrick can um, add maybe more more meat to this, is that there's likely more volatility in the electricity supply than there is in the RECs, which is the renewable energy. So when Mr. Helmuth and Patrick were just going back and forth, I, I think a lot of that was about the actual supply. So how much are we paying per kilowatt hour? And that is where all the volatility is and how, and that's the number that's really hard to predict. Um, I don't think Patrick or his team can tell us what recs are going to cost uh, to the dollar for the next eight years. But I think for the life of this next contract, they have a high degree of ability to say that it will be that amount you referenced, which was, I think you said $10 for every 5%. Because the, the rec amounts right now are far less volatile than the actual kilowatts. Okay. Uh, I would say Adam got that exactly right. Yes. Okay. okay. No, I'm okay. not going to do it. Mr. Hurd? All right, I'm going to try not to reiterate points we keep trying Reiterate, to. please. It's, it's so I, in my first line of question was along the same lines as Mrs. Mahan, is I looked at that figure, and I, I thought to myself, and you know, I don't want to sound, offend anybody, but that wasn't, I was like, wow, that's it's not a huge increase here. If we, for every 5% we go up, $10 a year, that's not, that seems reasonable, and it allows us to kind of be a baseline for to look at what we how far we want to increase this and it also lets us go you know we have to take a vote then we have to go out and face our constituents and neighbors and friends and family and tell them why we voted a certain way and i am at least based on the materials i'd go out and i would say but well this is the numbers that we're provided with so i guess my question regarding the ten dollars and i is not I don't want anyone to tell me it's exact or they can protect the future, but is if, when we say volatility, is it gonna be $11 per 5% or is it potential that it could be $20, it could be four times as much as the increase that we're seeing? So is the volatility a smaller percentage of that $10 or is it likely to be sort of an extreme percentage off of what we're seeing here? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Chaptalin. You both signaled, but go right ahead. So I, I, I want to, you know, and to be fair, you know, Talia and I have to spend hours with Patrick to get our heads around all of this. Um, so the volatility is around the price for the electric ele electricity supply which is highly influenced by the cost of natural gas. And the natural gas market is what is so volatile right now. So the price that we are having 
that we you know that no one can really predict is how much anybody whether you're part of this program or not is going to be paying per kilowatt hour for electricity going forward what we have more assurance of is when we're buying the renewable energy which is added on uh, or part of what we're buying we know what that costs we know what the price of a wreck is so there actually there isn't really volatility in that five percent equaling ten dollars right now okay the volatility yeah. is in again whether you're just part of eversource or national grid or you're part of an aggregation there's volatility in the actual price of the electrons that are flowing through the wires that we're using and charged per kilowatt hour. okay and i get that i'm just saying is it possible that based on market volatility it could the prices could be twenty dollars per five per, per every five percent that we increase as opposed to the ten dollar figure that we're seeing patrick what do you think about that yeah i think you know i think what we 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 would expect the the price of the, the renewable energy you know may, may move a little bit but it, it might be more like eleven dollars or maybe twelve yeah. that's the kind of movement we would expect to, to possibly see yeah so that i mean that is the answer that i'm looking for because i as long as we and again we're not going to hold anybody to what they say because it's not you can't guarantee what you can affect the market but i mean if it's twelve dollars per five percent and i was just doing rough figures if we were going from ten percent to fifty percent and i was at eighty dollars at ten dollars per five percent now we're up to a hundred that's still you know within a reasonable amount i would see to be able to achieve our renewable energy goals um and then so we're we're trying to set so say we set the default rate at 30 percent it's currently at 11 percent is there going to be any if someone opts down does it go from 30 percent directly to zero or is there an in-between stage that they can can they opt down to 11 percent from 30 percent So the way so the way the way it's currently set up is there's the defaults which everybody goes into, and then there's the opts up of fifty percent or a hundred percent. And when you opt down, you go down to zero additional, but you still are getting the renewable energy that's currently required by the state to be provided by any electricity supplier. So you don't opt down to zero percent renewable energy, but you opt down to zero percent extra renewable energy. There, if we increase the default, and someone says, "All right, you know, thirty percent is a little more risk than I want to take," I'm going off zero percent because this is what's on the chart in front of us. Is there a an option in between zero and thirty percent, or is it just either the thirty percent is the default, and if you opt down from the default, you're down to the zero percent additional? Mr. Chaptelin? Oh, no, Mr. Roach, so go ahead. That, go so ahead. I think I'm going to ask Patrick a question. My concern would be whether or not that would impact the aggregation plan that's been approved by the state. And I'm not sure we could do that without without opening a whole multi years long process with the state again. Uh, yeah, Adam is spot on. So the aggregation plan that's approved by the Department of Public Utilities uh, specifies uh, a number of options. It, it says that your default product can have more renewables than required, and you can have these optional ones that go up. It also says you can have one that um, has no extra renewable energy. So there's not really, uh, in the way the aggregation plan is written today, there's not space for some sort of middle ground be between the two. Um, and I think also what we've found is the basic is that where we, the basic is, as we call it, it's just been really helpful to, um, it's in fact, it's even more sort of beneficial the, the higher your, your default, uh, option is just so that there's a kind of a, a place for everybody. And, um, and also we don't have too many choices when you know, sometimes you can have that, uh, analysis paralysis, there's, there's so many choices. So, um, I, I think we're for, for this renewal, particularly we are, um, we are we only have an opt down that goes to zero additional okay. All right. yeah i'm not at advocating to have an in-between option i just wanted to 
see if that option, the 11% would disappear. So that's fine. Yes, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Diggins, did I saw your hand go up earlier. Did you, I don't know if you have questions now, if you want to defer. Oh, no, I, I'll ask some questions now. You know, okay. and, and so, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and um, none of these, I think, will be um, repetitive. And feel free to give me as short answers as you want. I'll just make a comment, though, and maybe you can chime in on this. My sense, my sense is about with renewables. I mean, if anything, the risk I mean, uh, change would be to the downside as we get better at producing the renewable energy. I mean, my sense is that it gets cheaper. I mean, so that that I think you know, that we might actually end up seeing that instead of it being, you know, ten dollars per five five percent, it might actually be lower. Agree, disagree? That, that's all you, Patrick. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's a great question because on the one hand, yes, renewables are getting cheaper every day and uh, as we scale up. Um, the, on the flip side, all of our states in New England, particularly, have renewable energy standards that are increasing every year. So <clears throat> the new renewables that are coming on are cheaper than the old renewables, and increasingly cheaper than even natural gas. But the total demand for renewables is increasing um, at a rate that, that that's pretty equal to that. So uh, effectively, um, we're still generally we're still looking at sort of in, increased cost for for renewables. But but you're right that that the new stuff that's coming online is is getting cheaper. All right. So that's an interesting problem to have. I mean, so as we increase the demand of the renewables, the price goes up. But hopefully that will increase the incentive to to um, create more new renewables. That, that was insightful. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, so what are the communities doing? I mean, I saw uh, in one of the letters that Newton went up to 80%. Do we have a sense of what other communities are doing in terms of um, how much I mean they are increasing their minimum by? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Yeah, uh, Newton is probably the one of the outliers of, in the state. They added 62% on top of the state's 20%, and that gets you to about about 80%. Um, so, and and yeah, the state's at, at 20% next year, so uh, or this year, sorry. Um, so uh, let's see, Somerville uh, launched their program about the same time, or really the same time as, as Arlington. They are looking probably at the 15, 20% range. They have 10% right now. Um, I think what we've seen is is Arlington was one of was along with Somerville um, and uh, was one of the first to to do five percent back in 2017, which was like, can can we do this five percent? Can can we do this? And the, and the answer was yes, we, we can do it, which is great. So then um, most uh, you know Arlington and Somerville, uh, Melrose was similar, uh, doubled to ten or or eleven percent in your case in the renewal. Um, and then most other communities have kind of followed suit. So 10% is sort of the new around the state for the green these green aggregations. 10% has kind of become the new the new norm. Uh, you've got you've definitely got a few communities who uh, like Bedford recently went up to 20%. Um, I think Westboro is up at at 20%. You, you're seeing it's sort of like the leaders now are like like there's sort of like you know 10 10 communities or less probably who are. Um, 20% or above, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. So any sense of the elasticity in, of what happens as you increase the uh, percentage? We, we do we, do people tend to drop off as we increase I mean, the, the, the minimum? And if so, do you have a sense of I mean, what that rate is? Uh, yeah, I, what I could say overall is and, and as I think Talia mentioned this a little bit in her program that the the program has um, it has, has, has got actually a few more participants in it now than when you launched originally. And I think what we've seen across our communities is is your the economic competitiveness of the rate is really what keeps participation up. And because um, when it, when when you don't compete well, that's when third party marketers start really swooping in or people you know leave to go to the utility. So I think. Um, you know, we have, uh, yeah. So I, I think that's sort of the the, the trade off there is um, keeping within striking distance, yeah, of the utility rate. And, and this is a question to me. I think I know the answer to this, but it might reveal a gap in my knowledge. For those who have opted into a hundred percent, then anything that we do now isn't going to affect what they pay. Yes or no? 
And if it's yes, I'm really interested. <laughs> uh, so we will be getting a new rate for all of the options. We'll have to get new pricing. So we won't be changing. Um, so I, I effectively, yeah, so everybody, every rate will be, will be getting a new, a new rate um, that, yeah. Yeah, I understand, but 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 my, my point, I guess, is that we so based on the percentage, like if we go up by five I mean, percent, it's ten dollars a year more. I mean, those who are at one hundred percent are pretty much at their maximum, right? And so now the only change to what they pay is based on the rate. It's not really based on the percentage of the mix that the town determines. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. All right. All right. So, 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 1,600 or 1,100 people in Arlington really won't care what we do with respect to this. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Well. Well. Um, I mean, I would just say preliminarily. I mean, I, mean, I, I like the notion of going to 30 um, percent. Uh, mean, and then making the next two increases later on um, smaller. I mean, uh, uh, I, I like the future boards, whether I'm on it or not. Me to look back at us and go, you know, guys, thank you very much, as opposed to me, as opposed to me effectively kicking. The can down the road and um, um, for longer. I mean, I think we get more bang for our buck with respect to what we're trying to accomplish. With respect, to, uh, uh, trying to accomplish with global warming and trying to do better by the climate and and the, and the people coming after us by doing more sooner. Uh, and and so so yeah, that's where I'm headed. But let's um, hear from our chair and and others. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dickens. Yeah, I have a, a, a few questions. Uh, one on the the term of the contract that you're going to you're going to seek bids shortly, and we did 36 months or 33 months last time, and not knowing what the bids are going to be, do you do you recommend a 36 month period as a, as opposed to going out two years due to the volatility? Because I want to try to nail down some things that that we may vote to authorize tonight. Uh, go ahead, Patrick. Sure. Yeah, we uh, when we do go out to bid, we always get uh, yeah, terms from you know, as short as a year, you know, out to, to three years, or sometimes a, a little bit a little bit longer. Um, what we're seeing right now is that the, the future years, uh, the future year curves are pricing lower. So uh, you know, two years going to be cheaper than a one year, three years going to be cheaper than a, than a two year. So I think having that ability to go out um, three years and, and potentially, you know, even if, uh, sometimes it can really matter, even extending a month or two can actually, uh, depending on, can, can, can have an impact. So I think having the ability to go, uh, to go long would be, would be good to have that, um, have that ability. Okay. And, and one of the, we voted this three years ago and, and it was probably about 60 degrees warmer than the night we voted it than, than it was today. We were, in the Lions hearing room at the, at, at, at the time. And one of the real concerns we had as a board is when we set the default um, rate, I, it, or we went to increase it, we were concerned about maintaining the default rate because the, what we don't want to have happen is to have a rate that people go back to the basic, uh, or opt down to the basic, if you will. And, and part of our vote three years ago was, was basically giving the manager discretion um, to to find a percent that that he deems reasonable and sustains membership in the default and and so you know we've heard a different number of different communities have have different percentages until you get the bids back you won't know where that is and and I'd be in favor and we'll hear from the public too of of giving the manager some discretion in this and, and recognizing that we want to increase the default but just like you're uncomfortable answering what's gonna happen in the future. It's hard for us to pick a percentage yeah. when the bids haven't come back in, but we can give direction to the town manager on that. Um, just a question on the, on the opt-ups, because right now we have a 50% opt-up and a 100%. Again, this was a discussion we had before, and in talking to the town manager, <laughs> it seems that people, not too many people opt up to the 50%. You either go all the way up to 100, or you stay at the, what is now the 11 percent and and so um mr chaplain are you looking for direction from us too on the number of opt-ups on on this this next agreement that that may be entered so thank you mr chairman so i 
I don't think we was we weren't specifically asking for it, but we would welcome that guidance. And as you just mentioned, I think the reality is that if we get up towards that 20% or more, it will render the 50% opt up option somewhat moot or futile in that we will be at or above that percentage. So, you know, if ultimately the board is voting to give me some discretion in exercising a contract that increases the default while protecting enrollment in the default, and that via that discretion, we get close to 50% total in the default, I think we would likely try to move forward with a plan that only has the 100% opt up. And if the board endorses that, that would be helpful to know. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all the questions I have for right now. So I think at this point, why don't we hear from the public and then we can see if we have any motions. Sure. The first person I'm going to promote is Susan. Okay. We're going to have Susan identify herself. Okay. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Yeah. If you could just identify yourself for the record and for the public, and I'm sorry, I should have said this earlier, for the public comments, if you could limit the comments to three minutes or less, we would appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. So my name is Susan Brow, B-R-A-U, and I've tried to limit this to three minutes. Hopefully I can. I'm from Warren Street in Arlington, and I'm here in strong support of increasing ACES default rate to as high as we possibly can go, even higher than what was presented in the materials that was made available to town meeting. I understand, like Ms. Mahan mentioned, that the price of everything is going up right now. It's really a terrible time to be grappling with the utility pricing decision. Food costs are rising, gas costs are rising, streaming platforms like Netflix and Amazon are rising, and I'm sure like putting on another pricing consideration for Arlington households may feel a little insensitive. It might be insensitive. Even while I was talking to town residents about this ACE contract, I kept wishing that this negotiation was happening at a different time before inflation became such a factor for everyone, and especially before like increased prices to cold. I'm angry that gas companies and Netflix and Amazon kind of beat us to people's pocketbooks on this one, because those companies like Netflix and Amazon aren't as sensitive to like Arlington residents as I know the town manager is, I know the sustainability manager is for Arlington, I know the board members are for Arlington. They've like worked in a really healthy profit margin on all of their price increases. So while we're worrying about the environment, they're like, you know, they're going to be fine with the margins that they've added to all of their pricing for groceries and gas and all of that. When I look at the price increases for the default range, it looks like the increases that we're worrying about are maybe like $30, $40, $50 more per year to make our electricity sustainable. But, you know, that's really not a lot when we think about it. When we think about the increase that like Netflix or Amazon is asking for, you know, we're right in that area. I think if we talk about a really bold increase for Arlington, when I look at the town's chart about pricing, and it talks about a 5% increase in the default level may cost Arlington households $10 on average per year. That means if we reached for 100% renewable Arlington energy by 2025, it might cost the average household about $140 more per year. It's just per year to get to that 100% rate, which really doesn't feel like that much to me. So even though I know that we're talking about a smaller default, I really want to put this in perspective. If we reached for the moon, what that might mean. 
Um, You're just and, over and, three minutes now, so I, if you oh, have a sentence sorry. or two to wrap up on, that 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 that's fine. But otherwise, no, um, but, no, I appreciate that. So so I appreciate that. I'm really not flippant about the cost of $140. I know that that's a stretch for some people, but but I really want us to be very bold in this decision and um, think about it in terms of all the other costs that we have in in our household budgets. That's okay. it. Thank Th you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening, Mr. Linoff. Good evening. Uh, I'm Alan Linoff. Uh, for the past two years, uh, I've been in a group of volunteers working to publicize and promote the ACE option to choose 100% local renewable electricity. Uh, we've used several approaches to spread the word, uh, including distributing over 150 yard signs. I've delivered over 100 of them myself. Uh, my motivation to spend time promoting ACE comes from being aware that we're on track to leave our children a severely damaged world uh, with enormous costs for them to bear. I think you hear a lot about flooding in East Arlington already. Uh, rising sea levels threaten to make the flooding much worse and affect many more properties. So our, our efforts to encourage people to opt up to 100% have been very successful as uh, Talia talked earlier in comparison with other towns that have similar energy programs. But with all our work, the vast majority of ACE customers are still at the lower default percentage most of those people have not made a decision that the default is right for them. They simply haven't tuned in, or they're confused about electricity choices, or they just have not gotten around to finding the opt-up form and filling it out. We need to make rapid progress toward getting our town to 100% renewable electricity. Uh, and to get to our goal of 100%, we will at some point have to go beyond aiming to match or beat the Eversource price. Uh, I believe that we should raise the ACE default rate to 30% over the state minimum with this next ACE contract. And I ask that you endorse taking that step. Thank you, Mr. Lenoff. Hi, good evening. Uh, good evening. This is Ryan Kapowski. Uh, I live on Summer Street in Arlington, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm actually here this evening as a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee, and specifically I'm the liaison on the committee uh, to work with uh, town staff on the action item in the Net Zero Action Plan regarding getting us to 100% uh, renewable electricity by 2030. I've also been on the energy working group uh, since oh, 2010 or maybe even earlier. So I had a small hand in helping the town establish the ACE program back in 2017. Um, I want to start by just expressing my appreciation to the select board for continuing to support all the town's efforts around energy efficiency, clean energy and climate resiliency. I've worked on this my entire career and uh, it's great to live in a town where um, uh, the town is leading on these important issues. I think you've already heard from a couple of members of the public, you'll hear from a, a bunch more and you've heard from, from our town staff uh, around the options. Uh, reducing our emissions from electricity is one of the most important things we can do to meet our climate goals. 
And um, it's actually, uh, the ACE program is actually one of the most cost-effective ways to do that. It's actually, we're, 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 we're talking a lot about cost, but this is actually a fairly cost-efficient way to achieve emissions reductions. Um, so I'll just encourage you uh, to be as bold as you can as you um, give guidance to the town manager and to uh, the sustainability manager. I'm actually very confident we'll get to 100% uh, by that 2030 uh, timeframe uh, as we implement, um, you know, ever higher levels. But I'll also point out that it's the cumulative emissions that matter. So it's not just the annual target, but actually the total emissions that go into the, to the atmosphere. So the more aggressive we can be now, the more impactful our decisions will be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. McIntyre. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little bit dark today. Um, my name is Patty McIntyre. I'm a member of Mothers Out Front, and I'm also co-coordinator with Sue Rao, who spoke earlier um, uh, on Mothers Out Front's uh, ACE campaign. Um, when I was thinking about what I was going to say tonight, um, I came across a newspaper article that I thought was timely and important. I don't think with three minutes I'm going to be able to quote some of the some of the items in the the article, but I'll just mention it and mention some of the points that that struck me. Um, so in yesterday's New York Times, Thomas Friedman wrote a, an opinion piece on how to defeat Putin and save the planet, um, which I think is very timely. And he talks about how we need to. Um, get off our oil addiction and what it means for the world economy. He, talks, he talked about hopeful things, things that we can do, solutions. Um, but a couple of the things in his um, opinion piece struck me. And one of the ones that he mentioned was that um, climate change has not taken a time out for the war in Ukraine. Have you checked the weather report for the North and South Poles lately? Simultaneous extreme heat waves gripped part of Antarctica this month driving temperatures there to 70 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the average for this time of year and areas of the Arctic making them more than 50 degrees warmer than average. That really struck me and it scares me and it scares me to read about wildfires on the west coast and hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and all of the terrible weather that we've, um, we've seen over the past many years. Um, so sometimes it makes me want to crawl into bed and pull the covers over my head. And sometimes I just want to watch Netflix that Sue said is so expensive, um, but I can't do that. Um, I have two kids, two young adults, and I need to try to do everything I can to help. Um, it's why I joined Mothers Out Front and why I urge the town to take bold action for the ACE program by raising the default as high as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Amy Ansack. That's A-N-T-C-Z-A-K. I've been a resident of Arlington for eight years, and I'm here as another member of Mothers Out Front and as a mother of two young children. I have seven-year-old twins. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I can vividly remember when I realized how dire the climate crisis was. It was 2018 and the United Nations IPCC report had just come out that said we only had 12 years to make pretty drastic systemic changes before the effects of climate change became irreversible. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I remember sitting at the table reading the New York Times article about the report while my kids sat across from me eating a snack, dropping goldfish all over the floor, and I just thought, my God, it, these three-year-olds would only be 15 in 12 years. What kind of future was waiting for them? And unfortunately, here we are almost four years later with even less time to make necessary changes. And the world continues to use fossil fuels and emit greenhouse gases at an alarming rate. Now, as a mom of young children, the thing I need more than anything else is time, as I'm sure so many of you can relate to. I need more time with my kids to run errands, to catch up on work. There's just never enough time. 
But the same is true for climate change, right? We are simply running out of time. Today's young people will grow up in a climate altered by our choices right now. Four years ago, Arlington faced the choice of whether to adopt community choice aggregation. And by choosing to take action, we've saved over 10 million tons of CO2 emissions. That's amazing, but it's nowhere near enough. And the time for small incremental changes has passed. If we wanna make sure that our children have a livable climate, we need to take bold action now. I urge you to raise the default rate for renewable energy for the town to the highest rate feasible, given the crisis facing all of us. Here in Arlington, we've declared a climate emergency and we've set a goal to reach net zero by 2050. And that's great, but frankly, 2050 is too late. We need to reach net zero well before that and increasing the default rate for, through the ACE program is the fastest and most efficient way to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. As others have mentioned tonight, renewable energy is the cheapest source of energy. And as more solar panels and wind farms are installed, it will only get cheaper. Relying on fossil fuels as an energy source is not only environmentally irresponsible, but it gets more fiscally irresponsible every year. And clearly current events have shown us that relying on oil and gas for energy is dangerous for so many reasons. Arlington has been a leader on many fronts and this issue should be no different. Let's show our children what bold leadership looks like and that we did everything we could to make a difference for them. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, and, and while we're waiting, how many people are on the list right now? After Bruce, you get four. Okay, thank you. It's a, why don't we, at, at that four, that we'll have the four speakers and, and uh, then we can get back to our deliberations. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Brucey Moulton. I live in Precinct 12. I have been a member of Sustainable Arlington for 12 or 15 years, and I am co-chair currently of Sustainable Arlington. I am speaking first to say that at our March 16th meeting, our group took the vote to ask for the highest possible increase in the default amount for renewable energy, just as we did at the time of the last contract negotiation. We think that climate change is kind of like a wildfire. When you're fighting a wildfire, you don't turn the hose in the opposite direction. And we are asking that we turn everything we've got to reducing the amount of fossil fuels producing our electricity. And that is by increasing the renewable energy percentage in the default as high as possible at our earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Millie Trummer. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Millie Perlmutter. I live on Harlow Street in Precinct 7. I am also a member of Mothers Out Front. And um, I support everything that has been said so far. I will simply add that I am urging you to act um, as leaders in this fight we are in for really the future of our children. Um, we heard earlier tonight that what towns do matters. What towns do matters to other towns. We in Arlington have been a leader and by increasing the default as much as possible, we can continue to push other towns around Massachusetts to raise the amount of default that they see as possible. We also are leaders because we communicate to the market that there is a market for renewables. And so we help to increase the supply by sending signals to the market that we care about having renewable energy. And last of all, we send a signal to our children that we are leaders in the fight against climate change. So that as our children look at us asking how we have helped to fight this fight that we are in, we can look them in the eyes and tell them how we are leaders in this fight. I urge you to set the highest default possible. Thank you. Thank you for your comments.
Can you hear me? Yes. Right. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Claire Moody, M-O-O-D-I-E. I live on Richardson Ave. I'm writing as co-coordinator of Mothers Out Front Arlington, Pierce School Green Team Lead, and also for the mother of two young boys. I, too, am strongly in favor of the highest default rate possible for ACE. Um, we need to shift as quickly as possible to renewable energy sources so we can meet our net zero plan for the town. An increase from 11% to 20 or even 30% over the state requirement just isn't enough to meet our goals, show Arlington's leadership in the area, and make the time-sensitive shifts we need to make now. Energy prices are in flux for several reasons, including the heartbreaking geopolitical conflict in Ukraine. It's the time to invest in local renewables, not continue to be dependent on fossil fuels, including natural gas. We are a town committed to taking care of each other, and I'm proud of the town's work to support households in need of assistance, for example, including the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. I know this work will continue, and Mothers Out Front welcomes any conversations to ensure all residents' needs are met. Also, the, the 72 pages of letters that you've received in support of a higher default rate for ACE is a strong indication of the support across the town. Please approve the highest rate possible this year to get us collectively as a town onto 100% local renewables as quickly as possible. My family and I thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, I'm having problems with my camera, but uh, thank you for recognizing me and giving me an opportunity to speak. I live at uh, 99 Warren Street. Uh, Len Diggins alluded to one letter referencing the action that the Newton Select Board took, and, and that was my letter. And uh, I, I just want to say that uh, it, it seems to me that 80% renewable as a default and 60% above the state minimum is something that Arlington ought to be shooting for, ought to be matching, if not in this round, then, then certainly in the next round. And uh, I guess uh, it, it, it strikes me that we consider it good that 1,100 households in Arlington are opting up when that's only 7% by my math of the total households in Arlington. I submit to you, members of the select board, that people aren't opting up because people have their heads in the stand and that you as leaders ought to be stepping up the way that the leadership in the town of Newton is doing and recognizing that we're in big trouble here. As Patty McIntyre alluded to, the article in the Times two days ago said that we're above freezing in the Antarctic and the Arctic, both poles, and it's winter in the Antarctic right now. It's above freezing in parts of the Antarctic in winter now. I'm, I'm not only upset because I'm scared about the future of our planet and our civilization. I'm upset because I'm seeing my own kids. I have two young adult kids, and I'm seeing them being even more negative than I am and losing hope. And uh, it, it just seems like, I, I mean, I understand that, that in, in Arlington, we're doing more than most communities, right? Like, you, you know, uh, having a goal of getting to 100% in 10 years, that's great. That's more than most communities. But it, it seems to me that, that we ought to be up there with Newton because when we look at what is being done at others, other levels of government and in the private sector, there's just a complete 
abdication from responsibility. Just to cite two examples, in the federal government, the Biden administration, which is supposedly, you know, introducing this great amount of leadership on climate, just decided to replace 165,000 old mail trucks with mostly gas, gasoline mail trucks when the technology is there to buy electric mail trucks, right? It's affordable, the technology is there, it's low hanging fruit, it would have a lot of symbolic, symbolic value. And the Biden administration is saying, no, that's too much of a heavy lift. Excuse me, Mr. Hazelton, you're, you're at about 315, so if you could uh, wrap up your comments, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I guess what I'm, what I'm asking for is for leadership from the town select board to acknowledge that we as a progressive community need to be way out in front, not just better than Somerville. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Hanlon. I live on Park Street in uh, uh, Precinct 5, and I'm a, pre a town meeting member of Precinct 5. Um, I submitted probably about three or four pages of the 72 pages of letters that you already have, so I don't really need to say all that much uh, orally. I just wanted to try to focus in on some of uh, background assumptions of much of the conversation. The first thing I think that that the people who've talked to, to sent you the letters that you've talked tonight have at least provided some degree of security when, like Mr. Hurd, you face your constituents and explain what it is you decided to do. Uh, you're just as apt to have people applauding your leadership if you are bold here uh, than people questioning your fiscal responsibility. Um, so I think that should be reassuring. Second is I think that Len Diggins is exactly right, that not only will future boards, but Arlington will thank you for being aggressive now and front-loading the changes that need to take place. As Mr. Potofsky told you, the key thing is not whether or not you get to 100% by 2030, it has to do with cumulative emissions. And if you get, get there in sooner rather than later, the value of cutting those emissions or of, of cutting the amount of emissions that ultimately are, are done because of what the electricity you're buying are more important. Basically, when you're dealing with climate change, backloading the solution is almost never the right answer. And so you need to sort of take into consideration that acting soon is really important and maybe more important than how much you do altogether. Uh, as is frequently said, uh, winning uh, slowly is another word for losing when you're dealing with this. And therefore, being bold now and doing as much as you can now um, is something that, that is valuable. If we were dealing with steady energy prices, this would have a, this conversation would have a slightly different tone. Uh, there's a certain degree of caution and, and anxiety that is created by all of the uh, uncertainty that there exists in, in the market, which is relatively less stable now than it has been in the past. Um, it's an ironic thing because if there is a problem later on, it's likely to be not because of the instability of the, the instability of the, uh, uh, of the renewable, the Rex, it's the instability of the underlying amount. If, if there's a sharp inflation in the electricity price, for example, the base electricity price, the RECs will be relatively cheaper compared to the uh, underlying price. So it would be a good thing to sort of be a little nervous about being nervous and to think that it's time really to, uh, to knuckle down and to do as much as you can now. I know it can't be everything, but it can be a lot and you should be as courageous as you can bring yourself to be. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your comments. And, and before I turn it back to the board, it, if I could just, 
we know that the opt up to the 50% and the 100% was about 7%, but what's the breakdown currently between those who select the default rate versus the basic, if, if you have it? I think I do have that handy. Or Talia, do you have that? So I have the number of accounts in the Oh, and so you're asking the default versus the basic, is yes. that right? Yes. Okay, I have, Patrick, I have here the 150% options. Yeah, so I've got the basic, we have uh, a little over 1%. I think we have uh, about 170 uh, participants in that. Okay, all right. Thanks, Patrick. So, so 90, if my math is right, 92% select the default rate then seven percent who walked up one percent who select the basic and 92 percent select the default right that's right does that, does that math work yeah okay all right good all right so i'll, I'll um turn it to, to board members oh sure yeah. mathematical question yeah. um i know we're talking about we can't tie anything to it but when we're talking about ten dollars per year at five percent that's at six hundred dollars per year for electricity um, I'm assuming, can somebody give me the range or give me um, if you're at basic versus 100, approximately what your yearly bill is right now? Because I'm assuming it's probably more than 600 more times than not per year. Do you understand my question if I can get the range of, I know you picked for $600 a year, it's about $10, mm -hmm. don't hold us to that. but. Um, can you give me a guesstimate range of what the actual participants' yearly um, electricity bills are? Yeah, Mr. Roach, I could, I could start and tell you. Feel free to jump in. So, with in the current contract, it's if you were going to from from the basic to the hundred percent, it's somewhere around a hundred seventy. $180 extra a year. So that's on top of that, say 600 base. And what is also helpful to know is that 600 is for the supply portion of the bill. So there's also the delivery portion that just, just ever source. Um, and that's about the same amount. It's about another, another 600. Right. So, um, that's better. yep. Thank you. That's That's what I thought. And, um, I want to ask the chair, the, Vote tonight, and I'd like to be aggressive um, and, and, and set a higher percentage, and I'd like to be compared to um, when other communities are contemplating this, um, Arlington sort of be in the forefront, although I don't know if we can get to the Newton 80 percent here tonight. I'm not advocating for that. But am I correct in understanding that the vote that, or am I incorrect, that the vote tonight is to um, approve and authorize the town manager, the sustainability manager, along with the consultant to um, set the, what I think I'm hearing from my colleagues and myself, uh, the most high aggressive rate um, versus us saying what that rate is tonight. That, that's, I, that's again, given I, the that's uncertainty, what that's, yeah. that's what I think would be prudent for, for, for us because we, the town manager and, and the, the consultant aren't going to have the bids in yet. I can read what the actual vote was from last time, maybe just to, to and, and again, last time there was a concern about savings in the program. I don't think you're hearing that from anybody here tonight. We're really talking about increasing the percentage of renewables. So the last time we authorized the man, town manager to enter a 36 month contract, I'm going to, at that time, there was a goal to maintain town savings. I don't think that's going to be on the table anymore over the length of the contract. But here, here is the part that I think is, is relevant. And increasing the mix of renewables to a percent that the town manager finds feasible and sustains our membership in the default. Now, I, I think we could provide a range. We want it no lower than this, maybe have a goal on the upper end and, and give them some flexibility there, depending on what happens. But again, open that up to the board. Uh, Mr. Hellman, did you have anything further, Mrs. Mahan, on that? Or? Nope. Okay. I'll make a motion unless somebody else does if okay. it doesn't get made. 
Yeah, I don't have a motion, but I think I, I just want to, you know, I've traveled from starting this discussion a few weeks ago thinking we should preserve savings. And I've come out of this realizing that, you know, I think a lot of people have asked us to, to raise it to the maximum. Well, the maximum would be 100 percent. But I think that we have to be honest that that would almost certainly have an effect of getting people to just drop out, you know, and drop down to zero. So I think the real maximum for me is that whatever the level is that will preserve participation. Because if we go to 100%, we could lose more renewable gener uh, utilization than we gain. And I think it's really important for the public um, to understand that that's the parameter that we have to be resp responsible for. Um, if the town manager and our consultant and Ms. Fox felt like we could do 100% now and preserve participation, I'd be there. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for getting ahead of 2030. I don't know, you know, and that's where I think we need their, their expertise, particularly since we don't have the bids. Um, and the last thing I just want to say, uh, Mr. Hanlon uh, referenced his letter, and I think it was a wonderful letter, and the most wonderful part was the last line, where he said, we sh urging us to resolve uncertainties in favor of the climate. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, uh, there are going to be edge, we're talking about the edges here. There are going to be uncertainties in, in where we risk. I want to risk in favor of the cl climate. And I think I'm really comfortable talking to our constituents and saying that that's what we did. I don't know where the number is. I want it to be high. Um, but that's kind of how I'm thinking. And I will leave it to those of you who've done this before to, uh, to formulate a motion. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, and again, to Mr. Hanlon's point that he made in sort of along the same lines of what my colleagues have said, I'm certainly aware that I think the residents want us to be as aggressive as possible with the amount of renewables that we put in the default rate. And I 100% agree with that goal. And like Mr. Helming said, it, as I look at the increases and the pot potential fluctuations, I mean, again, I don't want to speak lightly of price increases for people, but I'm not, I don't look at the price, the potential price increases as the barrier to us going to 100% or what, or a higher amount, I think in, it would be nice for the sport to say, hey, you know, we're gonna put it at 100% to show that we're behind fighting the climate crisis, but we also have to strategize when we do this to make sure that not only are we making a statement, but we're also affecting the maximum amount of change and the maximum amount of carbon reductions that we can through this program. And so that's w the considerations that we have to make that might make this vote a disappointment for some of our residents. And that's just something as being an elected official that you have to deal with sometimes. But I mean, I think from so a couple of the options that we've seen where we have the four tiers and it sounds like we can go to three tiers. I mean, I think we, should be aggressive, as aggressive as we can be, and, and authorize the manager to be as aggressive as he can be with the amount of renewables that we put in the default rate, and then just leave it to the 0% that we have to have in there and the 100% that we have to have in there, because it just it seems a little confusing when you have something in between. And with the three rates, in my mind, I'm thinking that we'll, we'll, we'd set it around 50%, that might be too aggressive based on the contract that the manager has to negotiate from ourselves. But I mean, I think we do have to put some sort of a, so I, I would advocate given the manager guidance for three, a three tiered rate system and put a range of 30 to 50% based on, and say whatever he is based on his negotiations within that range, what is the, most beneficial contract that he can negotiate on behalf of the town. And, and, and the, thir the third, th so that would be the basic default and 100 percent. That would be the okay. Um, Just a quick question, Mr. Sure. sure. Is is the Mr. Hurd is the 30 percent, 30 50 percent? Is that um, inclusive of the state minimum or on top of the state minimum, which is around 20 percent? So, I I was looking at the rates as we had it here with the 11 percent. So it's on top of it. On top of it. Yeah. Got it. Top of it. Top yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah. I, well, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. The, the, I, again, I look at the range from zero. So the state minimum is 20%. Right. I'm looking at zero to 100 from, from that perspective. Any, yes, yeah, so so that would be the thirty percent plus the twenty percent then for right. Okay, all right. Um, any other comments? I have a couple. Oh, Mr. Diggins. Um, so, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, so it's not at all clear to me, me that even if we, you know, well, first off, I mean, um, what is the maximum that we can raise it by? I'm not sure to whom that question is. I imagine it's either Adam or, or one of our guests. Mr. Chaplain. Are you asking? I mean, could, are you asking? Could we go to a hundred percent if it was the will of the board? Uh, well, no. I'm just wondering what, what, what. So the state next year or in 23 is going to be at 20 percent. So then, for us to get to 100 percent, it would be 80. We'd be plus 80. Right. But the okay. state, the state goes up by two percent a year. By two percent a year. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. So then, so then, but when we make our contract we are going to be locking in a percentage or does that percentage fluctuate or change as the state steps up? We would lock in our percentage, but then be the beneficiary of step ups in the state program. But our local percentage would be locked in at one of I got you. I got you. I mean, so, so if we go the maximum, then we would have every incentive to, to do a longer contract, which could, could possibly bring our rates down. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. I think based on what Patrick said earlier, yeah. yeah. And and okay. depending on what the bids actually are, when Patrick and his team at Good Energy comes to us and said, "Today, today's the good bid day. Here are the bids that are in hand: twelve month, twenty four month, thirty six month, whatever is most beneficial." So we get we get bid information before we commit. Is that the deal? We don't have to commit. I thought maybe we had to make a commitment before we went to bid. So ultimately the way that, all I can speak to is the way this has played out the past two times. And it's been that, you know, with about one or two days notice, the team from Good Energy will email us or call us and say, Wednesday, our projections, our experts are telling us Wednesday will be a very good day to bid these costs. Can you be available at 11 o'clock? And we'll say, yes, we're available at 11 o'clock. And they will come in with They'll, you know, they'll literally get those bids emailed to them while we're sitting in the room. And then based on what those bids are the past two times, we've made the decision about what we think we can do for a default under that guidance the board gave with a focus on both in the past providing savings or maintaining savings, as well as maintaining as many people as possible in the default. Right. Given what the board is, the contours of what the board has discussed so far, we would sit in that room again, focused on maximizing the default while protecting the default um, aimed at not having people migrate out of the default into the basic. Right, and and on what basis would you be determining that people are gonna migrate out? Because that's what my question was about the elasticities. I mean, it seems like we have no real elasticity data. We would use, we, we would depend again on Patrick and his colleagues at Good Energy looking at what they think market rates are going to be or what utility pricing is going to be. And ultimately the way this has played out in the past is um, the team from Good Energy saying, if you go over X cents a kilowatt hour, our fear would be you would see a larger number of people migrating out of the default. And that's based on just a, a, a rough understanding of what their projections show utility rates will be in the upcoming periods. Uh -huh. I mean, right. and the picture is, this hasn't actually been said tonight uh, or with any level of, of detail. You saw in that chart, changes every six months, right? The utility sets their rate every six months. It's high in the winter, January to June, lower usually in what's the summer rate setting period, which is July to December. So when Good Energy looks at this, they're going to try to like look at it across the board. And we almost always want to be a winner or at least even in that winter setting, you don't want to lose in the winter because you don't want people to leave the program altogether. And you have an expectation you might not win in the summer because summer rates are always lower because you don't have the heat load and the electricity load at the same time. But ultimately with good energy's expertise, they're gonna give us their best you know, projection or assumption 
for where we'll be at a safe number and keeping people in the program. Right. All right. Well, I think, I mean, if we give you discretion to be as aggressive as possible, we, uh, and seemingly we're, we're aiming, it seems like we're going to have a floor at 30. I mean, I'm fine with that. And I'll just say, one of the ways to discuss this is like me right now, we're seeing like, let's say we, if we do the X percentage, I mean, it's, it's $50 a year. I mean, if we said $500 every 10 years, I mean, it would be like, oh my goodness, I mean, that's a lot. But if we say $5 a month, you know, I mean, that goes down a little more easily too. So I think it's just really what kind of, um, of unit time we discuss this in that can make it easier for people to um, accept. Um, so that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, so just on the, the percentages that, that were provided and, and it's actually happy to hear that the basic was only 1%. I mean, we know now at 11% people aren't opting down. If they're entering the program, they're coming in at the default rate at 92%. And for whatever reason, whether it's, it's, it's education, whether it's, it's the, the, the way the program is presented or people just don't want to go up, only 7% are going up above the default. So there's room on the default and, and you know, perhaps there's a way to, to get the 100% up. I'm questioning my mind whether there should be a, a category between the default and, and 100, but I think given maybe less is better for, for, for this time period and just have a, a default and a and, hundred percent, but it, it's, I think we've all been struck by the, by the comments that we've received. And I, I just notice a big difference from three years ago to today, the, the urgency to do something. So I, I'm just speaking for myself. I mean, I, I could support a target of 30%, but giving the manager some, um, you know, some room depending on, on what comes in on the, on the, um, on the bids, but on, maybe put a floor too that it, it, it shouldn't be below a goal of 30%, but no event less than 20% given where, where things are. And maybe that's too, too broad a goal, but I think you have opt-ups. The nice thing about this program having opt-ups, you set a default, you wanna maintain the default rate, you wanna increase the percentage of renewables and give people an opportunity to go up. But that's, that's the nice thing about having an opt-up provision. So you don't wanna go, too, too high and in, in, in respecting what happened in Newton, good luck to them. But I, I, I think we want to maintain the default rate and encourage people to opt up and see how that goes. And three years from now, we can take another look at it. But that's um, just my individual comments based on what we've had here. Mr. Helmuth? Just a quick question. Um, do we know, does anyone said, for thinking about whether we have, how many gradations we have, how many, when people opt up, do they do we have most of them going to 100 percent? Most of them going to 50 percent? You know, is that just about all 100? I think from oh, yeah, what Mr. Chapter okay, yeah, told me earlier. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So at this point, do we have a motion? Or, 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 Mr. Chair, just comments, to clarify, are you looking to maintain the four options? No, I I, I was just thinking out loud. I I thought maybe we should have four, but clearly. The 50% option has not been well received, hasn't been used, so maybe it's better to have fewer options. So I, I could, yeah. I, I would support your yeah. use of three options. Because I, I think most people that take the time to go through the process to opt up and look at the actual yeah. monetary difference are going to go for the 100%. That's why I think we should, and if we're going to push the default to somewhere closer to the middle, I think it makes sense to have the three. Yeah, no, no, I agree, I, and I'm looking down the road. If, if three years from now we don't, if we find a lot of people still not opting up, then I think I would go back to to a midpoint. But anyway, at this point, uh, Mrs. Mahan, I'd like to make a motion to um, uh, authorize the town manager to um, establish the ACE default rate um, amongst the three-tiered system um, discussed by the board tonight. Um, with a goal of uh, no less than 20% um, uh, and I, I, I don't want to say but up to 30% I'd say the goal of no less than 20% um, but um, leave it to the manager uh, that when the bids come in um, the board would anticipate perhaps 30% or higher um, but not too much higher um, would be um, our, our goal for right now. So uh, vote to approve and establish the town manager to um, set the ACE default rate um, after the uh, bids come in 
and that process plays out a minimum of 20 percent uh, a goal of 30 percent or more Okay. Is that Thank appropriate? You. Yep. Uh, and can Sarah? I second that? Yes. And Ms. Mon, and just add just the word wording that with the target of maintaining, of setting the rate such that it will it won't drive people out of the system. Right. Or I didn't say that very so art artfully, so but cognizant of market yeah. demand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To, okay. to set the rate as high as possible without causing. A flood from the default rate. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, if I wanted to see if my colleagues were willing to set a higher floor, what would be the best way to do that? Would I offer my own motion or ask for an amendment? I, yeah, I think you could ask for an amendment. I, that, that's so. Um, you know, if my colleagues would be would support it, I would. I would. Um, thinking of, again about Mr. Hanlon's exhortation to to resolve uncertainties in favor of the climate, um, being twenty five percent. I would feel better about. I'd, I'd be. I'd feel great about thirty percent. I don't know if we're there yet, um, but um, if there's support, I, I would love for us to try to push it a little bit. Yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to do that, but I just want. Could I um, ask I, the, the chair your thoughts or the manager? Um, us setting percentages and everything. Everything is really contingent upon how those bids come in. Yes. Um, so I don't want to limit it. Um, I'd be happy to discuss the 25 percent, but that but that even further tie the manager and um, Ms. Fox and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on Patrick, Mr. Roach. Mr. Roach's hands. Um, what do you think? Mr. Yeah, I, I, I think I mean, we have a goal of 30 yeah. percent and only because we don't know what's coming. I think the message to the manager is we'd like to see 30 percent. And if, it, if it's feasible, even higher. But if, if, if bids come in and, it, and, and it, it looks like there, there could be a drop in the default, I, I don't want mm -hmm. that range to be so limiting to the manager. But I, I, and so mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying, but I, I think if, Mr. Chaplain, you're getting a message from us where, where we think that the range should be, but uh, Mr. Hurd? And again, we trust the town manager to handle this contract appropriately. We could say, not to overcomplicate this motion, but a floor of 25% with giving the manager discretion in the event that pursuant to the bids and the advice of our consultants, going to 25% or higher would cause less yeah, participation. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Then Perfect. Mr. Right. Mahan, is that? That's fine. I'm not, I'm, I'm, whatever we can get back. To me, a good motion is something that's just general, which is to authorize the manager um, to negotiate and establish a default rate. We can add whatever we want to that, but I, I know the manager has heard our sentiments. I just don't want it. So I'm, I'm fine. Whatever gets us to the vote. Okay. All right. Um, so I think we'll get to a vote. If, if, do we have a second on Mr. Hurd's amendment? Yes. Okay. All right. And I think the language that Mrs. Mahan provided, you know, with that one, with that one change, and, and knowing that feasibility or, or diminution in the default is something that needs to be considered. I think we're ready for a vote. Yes. Um, okay. So on a motion um, made by Mr. Hurd, made made by Mrs. Mr. Hurd, no, made by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Roach, uh, for your time tonight. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item three, consent agenda, reappointment to the Arlington Redevelopment Board, Ken Lau. Move approval. approval. Okay. Second. Okay. We have a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Um, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. I'm getting chilly, so if anyone's watching me at home, I'm only sitting like this. It's not body language that I'm frustrated. I'm just cold. Attorney Hyman, you cold. threw me off when you were looking at me and you said Mr. Diggins. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was supposed to vote again. <laughs> um, keeping us on our Can't toes. Can't turn the heat on? Oh, my Lord. We still haven't got heat we have a, ability. We have a lot okay, of quick sorry, items on our agenda yeah. tonight. Uh, item four, presentation and requested adoption. <laughs> Arlington Housing Plan, Jennifer Rate, Director of Department of Planning and Community Development, 
Kelly Lenema, Assistant Director, Department of Planning and Community Development. Good evening, Ms. Wright. Good evening, Ms. Lanema. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight to discuss the Arlington Housing Plan. Um, I'm going to kick it off. I'm Jennifer Wright. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the town, and I'm joined by Kelly Lanema, the Assistant Director of the Department of Planning and Community Development. Thank, Thanks, thank, thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the support of the manager and the board's time and attention tonight. I'm going to give you an overview, sort of a background before we start our discussion. So if you'll, if, it, if that is okay. Sure. Thank you. Following the adoption of the master plan by the Arlington Redevelopment Board and its endorsement by town meeting in 2015, the Department of Planning and Community Development began implementation including moving forward with the first recommendation in the housing section of that plan, quote, plan for affordable housing by creating a housing production plan. The plan was adopted by the ARB and the select board in 2016, but it expired this past November in 2021. The plan was expansive with many broad as well as very specific goals and recommended actions. We accomplished several, but not all of the strategies in that plan, which included amending the zoning bylaw to allow for mixed use, parking reductions, and accessory dwelling units, helping the Housing Corporation of Arlington to develop 48 new permanently affordable housing units, providing funds to preserve existing affordable housing, including updates to Arlington Housing Authority properties, creating six new affordable homes through our inclusionary zoning bylaw through mixed use development, establishing the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, as well as seeking funds for the trust through a real estate transfer fee. It was important to update the plan as it has proven to be very helpful as a guide for many of our planning and community development efforts, including community conversation, conversations rather, and education. The housing plan helps us better understand Arlington's housing needs and demand, development constraints and opportunities, and improves our vision and shapes outcomes for future housing. Additionally, the plan helps us to control our 40B destiny, if you will, as it helps the town to add to our housing inventory, the subsidized housing inventory, which is monitored by the Department of Housing and Community Development. The plan also helps us to address the unmet housing needs of residents who make low and moderate incomes in our community, to influence the type, amount, and location of mixed income and affordable housing, and to possibly prevent unwanted 40B development through a certified housing production plan in favor of residential development that complies with local zoning. Due to our prior housing production plan, the town currently has a certified plan which allows our ZBA to deny comprehensive permit applications that do not align with local needs. We started working on updating the plan for the next five years in late 2020. And as you know, that was during the pandemic. We provided a range of unique engagement opportunities to provide us with input throughout the housing planning process. These opportunities went above and beyond the standard required two forums. They provided education and outreach opportunities and helped, helped us to meet people where they were at, literally at their kitchen tables, by providing what was called a, quote, meeting in a box. We offered that meeting types, that meeting type twice, attended farmers markets, provided an interactive mapping opportunity, conducted surveys, held forums, had interviews, and also held a community conversation on fair housing while we worked on a parallel effort to create a fair housing action plan. The Arlington housing plan that is before you tonight, once it is adopted by this board, will be sent to the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development for approval. The plan is consistent with DHCD's HPP guidelines and the purposes of a Chapter 40B housing production plan in that the plan analyzes demographic and housing data for an understanding of where Arlington is today, where it has been and where it needs to go, identifies local housing needs and how those needs relate to conditions throughout the region, recognizes the town's efforts to create affordable housing and how the town could do more, 
identifies housing development barriers and opportunities, educates one our community about Arlington's need for more affordable housing and a wider variety of housing types. And lastly, guides future affordable housing development to a variety of places in Arlington, both along the obvious roadway corridors, such as Mass Ave and Broadway, as well as across the town's varied neighborhoods. We're excited about the many opportunities that this plan provides and initiatives that are starting to move forward, including that the plan will help the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund with the development of its action plan, focus funding priorities for the Community Preservation Act and Community Development Block Grant Program, as well as ARPA funding, encourage new partnerships and relationships, including more opportunities to partner with the Arlington Housing Authority, and to help advance future amendments to our regulations to accommodate redevelopment. I want to thank all who participated in the plan development, specifically the Housing Plan Implementation Committee and Kelly Linema for her leadership, as well as our consultant team, Barrett Planning Group and Horsley Witten Group. With that, I will stop there and turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Um, okay, I, I, think, you know, I think we, we are gonna have public comment for this this evening, but I will start with um, comments or questions from board members. Um, Mr. Hellman? Um, this will seem a little bit out of the blue, but uh, some of the feedback we've been receiving from residents uh, about uh, expressing concern about increasing the number of households in town revolves around infrastructure, specifically our water and sewer capacity. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, perhaps through you, the town manager might comment on his opinion and that of, of his DPW leadership and staff about the town's infrastructure capacity in that regard, if there are any concerns about what is contemplated in this plan and in its targets with respect to that infrastructure. Mr. Chaptal? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and through you to Mr. Helmuth. So I have talked about this with uh, the DPW director, and the primary concern about our water and sewer systems capacity revolves much more around what's called inflow and infiltration. And that is where there are segments of the system where water, groundwater usually, or potentially even leaking water from some of our water pipes is infiltrating the sewer system and thereby creating more flow than can be processed at the Deer Island um, treatment plant during a storm event. Um, there's far less concern about adding just daily flow uh, from an increase in the number of households. Um, when a significant project goes forward, whether it be something like the Sims project a number of years ago, or a matter like uh, the 1165R uh, Mass Ave project, the Myrac property that this board uh, discussed some time ago now. There's always discussion about the water and sewer system to make sure that valves and pressure release valves and other systems are adequate. But my understanding is the actual capacity of the system to handle flow, uh, especially outflow, uh, is not a matter of great concern given the way the system is currently constructed. Thank you very much. Okay. Of course. Comments from, from board members? Okay. Um, if there are people now it's let me just see what it's about 9 15 um and I, I we've got a bunch of things on so let's let's do this we'll we'll take public comment um no later than 9 45 and, and if we get done before then um great so go ahead miss mar okay Am I speaking? Yes, you are. Yep. Go right ahead, okay. Ms. Preston. Yeah, <laughs> right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Joanne Preston. I'm a commissioner of the Arlington Housing Authority, and I have some comments on the housing plan that are made in consultation with our executive director. I want to start off by saying in the 2016 housing plan, the Arlington Housing Authority is described as a vital partner in maintaining and increasing housing diversity and affordability. No such description is in the 2022 plan. Instead, the housing, Arlington Housing Authority is described 
in a number of inaccurate and negative statements which i would like to ask that are corrected because this is a five year plan and the plan is used often in funding decisions and i'm afraid we would be negatively impact there are too many to say in this short amount of time so i just like to take the ones on page three the first one the arlington housing authority has not actively pursued new housing in a long time that should be replaced with after 50 years of building 715 units of deeply affordable housing for over 1,000 low-income residents the arlington housing authority is now modernizing its housing stock but at the same time we have applied in the last year for funding to increase our deeply affordable housing so that's wrong two the arlington housing authority lacks resources to manage the properties it already owns that should be replaced with despite a tight budget the arlington housing authority is able to manage day-to-day -day maintenance i'd like to note that the arlington housing authority has an active maintenance plan has been regularly meeting its goals and has tenant participation in monthly maintenance meetings three the Arlington Housing Authority manages five public housing developments. Well, it also has five condominiums and two small houses. All are under the state requirements for deeply affordable housing that meet or exceed those on the subsidized housing inventories. Four, a house and a condominium which are not income restricted. Well, they're under the Arlington Housing Authority. Um, However, I would like to replace it with a house and a condominium that should be included in the subsidized housing inventory as they meet all requirements. It's just a matter of submitting paperwork. These corrections should be made and with many more that I don't have time to talk. My great concern is several of these negative comments have already been on the online newspaper. And I was unable to talk the, the reporter out of them because after all, they're part of the formal housing plan. Um, and I, I can imagine as we move forward with the Arlington Housing Authority now in creating new low income housing units that these negative, there are other ones too, negative statements about the housing authority will be used in making decisions Excuse against Excuse me, Ms. Us. Preston? You're at about three and a half minutes, so if you can wrap up, please. Oh, my last sentence. Thank you. <laughs> so I wish you would seriously consider the, the need to change um, these comments about the Arlington Housing Authority, as it is the largest uh, entity for affordable housing in Arlington, and um, it deserves to be recognized as such. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Next speaker, Hi, evening, can Mr. you hear Wagner. me okay? Yeah. I, can you hear me if okay? If you have a phone, if you can twist it because you're, you're not, you're sure. Yeah, Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. All right. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Carl Wagner. I live at 30 Edge Hill Road in Arlington. Thank you uh, to the chair and to the board for hearing me tonight. Um, I've been present at the housing production plans presentation to the ARB and I made a lot of the meetings around this before also. Um, I, I think this plan is really faulty and I hope that people on this call as members of the public will recognize that you five are our only elected political officials who can stop this faulty plan from going through. It doesn't mean that a, a housing plan in general is a bad idea. It means that this one, which was produced by a consultant who should have known better because the consultant also worked on the master plan, uh, would reduce the diversity of housing in Arlington. And the production plan was presented terribly to the ARB. I'm not sure they even saw the final version they voted on. The public did not see the final version, which included at the very end, uh, reducing uh, single family zoning to make it two family zoning 
and most crucially to allow three families in this in the two family zones those those versions at least that were not visible to the public that i could see i wanted to remind the select board uh, that the arb and the planning department were specifically sh uh, warned by the town meeting in 2019 after they tried to put through density proposals that the town needed to be consulted and the people in the town needed to have a say in any kind of density proposals. And the, the 2019 result in town meeting was the density articles were rejected. On December 16th, 2021, this plan was presented by the consultant to the ARB and the lead consultant said, what we're doing by increasing uh, the zoning to make two families in the one family and three families in the two family is we're going to cause housing choice for higher income people who can pay for more housing in prices. This housing will increase the cost of Arlington's housing. It won't reduce it. We don't need to be increasing the cost of Arlington's housing. We need to be helping the people who live here. We need to reduce their taxes, not increase them, which this would, this proposal will do. There are other problems in the plan. You can see I'm focusing on the two families and single family and three families in the two family zone. Another huge problem was that the state requires this plan to take into consideration changes uh, affected in services like schools. And the plan gives only cursory um, time to that. Finally, I know I'm probably running low on time, but I'd ask you select board members, you actually live in Arlington, like the people on this call who are concerned about this. The planning department head doesn't live here. You have to vote today on something that could really, really hurt Arlington. Do you want your names to be attached to something that would, would turn Arlington into a, an urban expensive place? I ask you please to reject this until it comes back with a much better version. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. I'm going to say, I'm going to see you. Okay. Uh, Good evening, uh, Mr. Mr. Ward. Uh, yes, thank you. Am I here? Yeah, here I am. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Uh, before I start, uh, before, uh, uh, we only, uh, both my wife and I wish to address the meeting. We both got our, uh, put, like put our names in uh, and uh, she's agreed that I should, I should speak first. And if you would also recognize her at, at, at a subsequent time, that would be appreciated because we both have thoughts on this uh, 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 problem. Um, okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. Going back to the, uh, I, I've I've been involved with zoning issues in the town of Arlington. For, I'm sure for any anyone more longer than anyone else in this this virtual room, I guess you could call it. Uh, going back to my first town meeting in 1970, I stood with the people of East Arlington fighting uh, unsuccessfully on, uh, uh, too bad, uh, the first Mugar project, which wanted to plant high rise uh, 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 zoning, which would have permitted the Mugar uh, people to put high rise residential buildings in the swamp. Uh, a few years later, we found out that it wasn't a swamp, it was a wetland and you can't really do too much in a wetland. So they came back with a 40B, which will, which ultimately was approved, uh, that, that will let them uh, put something in the, uh, some parts of the wetland and avoid local uh, environmental protections. But as, as this, uh, the, the reason I, I go back this far in history, and I've been involved in many, many zoning issues in the past 50 odd years, is that I've seen a lot of plans uh, uh, in the town meeting reports and annual reports and this report, that report, we, we used to have a newspaper that reported these kind of things. Uh, and this is the worst one I've ever seen. Uh, it, it, it's not only it has the sort of mistakes that uh, Ms. Preston uh, elaborated on in, as the first speaker, but, but it has more terrible ideas. And Mr. Mr. Uh, Wagner spoke about the the, the uh, elimination of the single family zone, that's a real blow against homeowner choice. Two people who want a two family house have plenty of opportunities in the many two family zones and the two family zones that are already pre existing in the single family uh, district. But, but people in the single family district, if you're going to do away with it, they don't have that choice to live in a single family district. And I don't think that's fair. Uh, 
in ba basically, uh, and I, I will, uh, uh, this, this plan, if adopted and implemented, would destroy the town of Arlington as, as we know it. Now, there's some folks appointed uh, employees and board members who think that's okay. Uh, I hope that you, elected members, elected by the people, will not think it's okay to destroy our town. And that, that you will stand up and look at this plan, and I hope you've read it, and I, I, I hope you find that the many, the, the many bizarre, new, crazy ideas that are in there are inappropriate for Arlington. Remember, the, 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 the master plan, which was worked on not by a small committee and, and, and by some consultants, but by, by a, large, a large group over a period of years uh, and approved by town meeting, uh, said the only housing we need is affordable housing and senior housing. This plan does almost nothing for affordable housing and doesn't even mention a senior house. Not uh, one thing. Mr. Ward, I'm gonna to have to stop you there. You're at about three and a half minutes, but thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Still waiting for her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I, let's see. I, I think also um, Mrs. Warden wants to speak. I think that's what uh, Mr. Warden was saying um, at the end. Okay, great. Um, I wrote to you this afternoon, this morning. I hope you got a chance to read it. Um, I agree with uh, Mr. Wagner and the previous speaker, Mr. Warden. I just, I just want to approach this like uh, I'm a civil engineer, and I can't even fathom um, the proposed changes without a study of the town's infrastructure. So I'm just going to speak to you as um, a professional civil engineer, and um, I don't understand like, you know, the response from the town manager of um, infiltration and inflow. Of course, that's an issue um, in any sewer system. Uh, and I described in my letter, infiltration is like groundwater getting into cracked pipe. Inflow is um, sources that we know, say um, sump pumps going into sewer. And that's, um, yeah, that's clean water getting into the sewer. And yes, it, um, as far as calculating flow, um, you can't ignore adding additional raw wastewater into the system when the system is old. Um, and, and you just can't blanketly, you know, say it's okay. You have to look at it and study each area and it's miles of sewer. So I, I just, the report I, I was I couldn't believe it. They only have two paragraphs and it's titled water and sewer and it's titled water and sewer, but there's no mention of the sewer. And what they do mention about the water is so minimal. They mention a project that MWA is doing, you know, clearly they just pulled it from a website somewhere. It's, it's so irresponsible. Um, I, I just don't even know how to emphasize this to you. Um, I just hope that you do read um, this section that I'm talking about and then read my letter because I, I tried to, you know, briefly describe how an engineer sizes a sewer, just so you know, you know, and um, we, you know, we literally count the lots, okay, so like, you know, you take a street and you look at the zoning and you count the lots. So say if there's 50 lots, you say, okay, well, how many bedrooms per lot can we expect for a residential area? And then if it's a commercial use, you estimate it based on what you think the building's gonna be used for. And this is um, standard engineering practice. And it, it's not, a, a, you know, it, it's, it's, it works so far, right? Um, but it doesn't, you know, we can't just blanketly change it without consideration and study 
Um, so, you know, if this aligns with the, the water system plan for the town and the sewer, you know, I'm sure there's a sewer plan for the town, then let me know. And that would give me comfort. But as far as I could read in this report, there was no information, no coordination with the Department of Public Works. Um, I understand, like, I, I think it's just very irresponsible to say, oh, okay, the only issue is II. Um, if you're planning on changing a neighborhood, and I gave a scenario of a certain amount of houses tied to a pipe, and sure, if you're upstream, you're okay. But if you're the house downstream, you're, yeah. You're, yeah, we have a number of speakers tonight. You're at three okay. and a half minutes, but I appreciate the, the written comments and your okay. comments this evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, way back in January, I wrote to this board with a detailed account of some of the deficiencies in this housing production plan. I'll try to briefly summarize these points. The state guidelines require that housing plans use the most recent available census data for demographics and housing stock. It's written right there in the guidelines. Most of the research for this plan was done prior to the release of the 2020 U.S. Census data last summer and instead relies upon out-of-date American community survey data. In a moment, I will explain why that is significant. This plan was also prepared too early to account for the MBTA housing mandate, which will significantly shape our housing and zoning decisions in the next five years, particularly in the Alwai floodplain. A second flaw in this plan is that it promotes the contentious issue of eliminating single family zoning districts. This goes far beyond the scope of what the state requires, a plan that addresses developing affordable housing. Barrett Consulting, the author of the plan, was clear that this particular proposal had nothing to do with affordability, but was to promote greater choice among a certain demographic. It seems that we do not have a sufficient supply of $1 million plus duplex condos to meet the market demand. An affordable housing plan is supposed to address the needs of those making less than the median family income not those making more than 200% of AMI. But the most glaring deficiency of this five-year plan is that it fails to include the required infrastructure analysis on the capacity to accommodate anticipated future growth, most notably in our schools. Our previous housing plan devoted four pages to this type of analysis. This consultant has written but a single paragraph which dismisses school capacity as being of no concern based solely upon the 2015 McKibben forecast. And this is where the 2020 census becomes vital. Arlington's population is growing much faster than predicted back in 2015. We have already reached a population level that the McKibben report predicted we would not see for at least a decade or two. That 2015 school enrollment forecast is rapidly becoming obsolete. It did not anticipate our actual population growth and it did not take into account increased housing growth nor changing family demographics, which would result from new denser housing. We need a housing plan that takes these into consideration. We need to have a clear idea of what actual enrollment growth will be in the next decade and whether we can accommodate it with larger class sizes, having to rent portable classrooms again, or if we'll need to plan for a new $50 million elementary school. That is what we need in a five-year plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer.
may be having a little technical difficulty. Yes, I can. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. My name is Josephine Babiars. I live on Edge Hill Road in Arlington. And I second the comments against this particular proposal. I have a concrete example. At the end of my road, at the corner of Edge Hill and Johnson, there was a single family home. It is turned into two condominiums. The list price for one was 1 million, I think 1 million 30, and the other one was 1 million and 100,000. It was on a corner, so there was a capability of having a different curb cut, and there is virtually no yard or any kind of setback. It, this house was actually in a two-family zone. The remainder of my street, along with many others in the single family area, have yard lots of maybe 500,000 square feet. I don't know how you would build with zoning and all of the code requirements, a two family house given access. Maybe you don't think there would be a need for a uh, two driveways but people tend to use garages for storage more than anything else. And I don't know what to do with the crowding. Arlington is a town, not a city. And I think we lose a great deal by forcing single family zoning into two family. I would urge the board to postpone this decision and require additional information about how this could actually work in the town of Arlington using the single family zoning areas you propose to change as templates. Is it possible to have fire um, and ambulance access? What about the curb cuts that you would need? How is that going to impact the different code requirements? Do we have sufficient in, in addition to the requirements for education and requirements for um, the sewers that have been talked about, do we have sufficient police protection? Do we need to increase, increase fire protection because of the increased density? So I would really urge the board to require additional information before you take this momentous vote. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. And Okay. Good evening, Hello. Mrs. Warden. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, Patricia Warden, Precinct 8, thank you. Whatever else I say tonight, I want to be clear that this housing plan is a disgrace. It will destroy Arlington if enabled. There is almost nothing in it to help ensure sustainable climate provisions in housing production or to provide affordable housing although the master plan specified that the housing Arlington needs is affordable housing and senior housing. The report is a blueprint for enrichment and exploitation of Arlington for developers, landowners, hoarding landowners and their heirs. It is a mendacious document replete with false statements. If you, our select board, choose to approve it, then you are choosing to condone false statements, look at my testimony, and to enrich developers and landowners at the expense of taxpayers, mega million dollar overrides, and the diverse residents of Arlington and those in danger of homelessness and displacement. What is the purpose of these hearings? And um, are these hearings just a charade? Uh, 
the report should have and could have recommended for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to dedicate its funds to help the Arlington Housing Authority's maintenance of its large inventory of serviced affordable units and to enable purchase and renovation of existing market units for use as housing authority units available to those families um, making less than 30% of area median income. That would have brought the housing policy, housing plan into affordability requirement compliance with the state right now. The housing plan is not compliant and should be rejected. As a result, we see the Affordable Housing Trust Fund now competing against the Housing Authority for funds without giving any commitment as to how their funds will be used for affordable housing and if they will be used instead for incentivizing undesirable development, um, such as environmentally damaging 40B projects, which are favored by the Affordable Housing Trust Fund chair and very lucrative for developers. Arlington now is about to experience a regime change um, with a new manager we should make sure that she or he is not saddled with this defective plan. Please do not approve this housing plan in its current form. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say that I have participated in the Housing Policy Implementation Committee for three years, and I now get three minutes to discuss my experience there. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Okay, that, so that concludes public um, comment. Thank you for the comments and the written submissions that we received uh, as well. So, um, and I will look to the board for any uh, further comments, questions. Uh, Mr. Hurt? So I think there's a lot to unpack with a 110 page plan, but I mean, I would say that this plan is the result of a lot of work and the, the town, the planning department, and residents who have been involved in the process. And as you go through 110 pages of recommendations, you're not going to, I don't think anybody is going to read through and agree with every statement that they see in the plan. But we've certainly seen what the benefits, and we've heard what the benefits are of having the plan in place. Um, so though I don't, again, I, I don't think we're here to say that we agree with every word and every line that's been put into this plan, but as a whole, this plan is the sum of all the efforts in town to look at what our housing stock is, look at what our housing needs are, what the barriers are, and what, where we go from here. And I, 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 I support the plan, and I'd like to move approval of the plan. To adopt. To adopt the plan, yep. Um, and again, there's parts of the plan that I think one of the most controversial parts that's mentioned in the plan that we've heard here time and time again is the elimination of single family zoning. And we're all town meeting members and we're all about to take this, uh, the answer to that aspect of this plan we're, we're going to hear in the next couple of months as to whether or not the town's ready for that. Um, so there are long term goals here, the short term goals here, and some will come together quickly, some to, will take some time, but you know, I, I'm very happy with the efforts of the town, with the planning department and our town manager, town staff, and everyone that I'm sure just about every member that, that works at Town Hall has some hand in putting this together. And you know, I think it is a good statement of what our goals are, what our needs are, and a path to get there. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, anybody else wish to? Mr. Diggins? I'll second that in, in having been a part of the process. I mean, uh, he, he, as Mr. Hurd said, I mean, he, well, it's a straw man in a sense to say it's not perfect, but it, we, 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 it's a good iteration, you know, and we will iterate on it again in five years, you know, and, and we will listen to people's um, critiques and issues, you know, with it, and, and, 
and and deal with them accordingly. I mean, with respect to how we execute on this plan and then how we formulate the next one. So, so um, I'm, as some would say, onward with this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hellman? Um, yeah, I appreciate what my colleagues are saying. It is not possible to get a plan of this complexity and to agree with everything in it, you know, and I think that's not the point of the plan. Um, it, the plan is to give us a, a roadmap and a menu um, because the, we, we need to address the problem. And, you know, and I think I would respectfully disagree with some of the residents who, you know, have, who spoke with great conviction. I think this plan does a lot to, to try to do meaningful things to support affordable housing. Um, our problem is not a lack of vision in affordable housing, it's a lack of tools and resources. Um, and a lot of that flows down from the federal and, and from the state level, frankly. Um, there's things that we're trying to do with the real estate transfer fee, I think that would do a great deal towards making some of this possible. So I think in fairness, um, this plan contemplates a lot that would do that, and I think our staff and, and um, the, um, the town work hard on that. Uh, the one thing that gives me some pause is the single family zoning issue and that's just because we are at a decision point right now. I think we're about to find out. I think on Monday while the ARB feels about it, we'll shortly find out how town meeting feels about it and although, you know, notwithstanding what I just said, um, that we're not going to find a plan that everything that we like in, in, or that we necessarily are ready for, um, it does seem poignant to me that we're at a place where we are going to, for good or for ill, tackle this issue head on right now and get an answer right now. And if this is a five-year plan, I kind of want to know. Um, because once we adopt it, we adopt it, it's ours. And we're saying that we want to do this. And again, I know, you know, we, there's 110 thing, uh, pages in it. So I, I, I don't know, that I'm a, I have a, I don't know a motion or an amendment. I, I'd like to hear, I think, from, from uh, our final member here, thoughts on that. That's just kind of, I'm just pointing out this moment in time that we're at with this particular issue, given the community sentiment. Um, and I, you know, I'm conscious that, um, you know, I've often said to people, I said this when I was uh, campaigning for the seat last year, I think all, maybe all three candidates said, you know, that we're, we're intrigued by that possibility and probably not ready for it. So, you know, I think that we just, you know, we have to grapple with that. And it doesn't necessarily mean it comes out of the plan, um, but I'm just putting it out there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Maha? Um, thank you. Um, and as Mr. Hurd um, stated in his motion, this is to adopt a plan, adopt a framework um, to replace the plan that's, I think, existed for five years as this will. Moving forward, we need to have something. Um, I do want to, um, and, and again, this is not taking any changes. It, it's adopting a framework. Anything substantive has to go to town meeting the redevelopment board and then the town meeting and sometimes the select board gets to weigh in on it. So this, you know, this nothing here got approved. We adopted a plan, a framework. I, I do want to say one thing um, with respect to our colleague on the, the Arlington Housing Authority. If I could ask um, the planning director, Ms. Rate, um, from, from here on and sort of mo moving forward when we have reiterations of certain parts of um, this um, housing plan that we've adopted, um, especially on um, two of the points regarding um, the housing authority, uh, if we could just sort of reframe that um, in the sense of, uh, you know, the housing authority does have um, properties that they're managing, um, and I don't know if. if well, I think we can moving forward instead of saying, you know, lacks the proper resources. If we could sort of word that as, you know, is continuously working um, f for um, state as well as town funding for CDBG. You know, if we could kind of reframe that, because um, I know with the uh, electrical boxes, um, with the new roof, things like that, um, with the new executive director, with current um, veteran colleagues on the Housing Authority as well as um, two new additions of Ms. Preston and Ms. Bedelia that um, the board really is, you know, they've gone to for, apply for CPA funding, they've come to CDBG, which Ms. Raitt um, uh, also oversees that and um, 
has been instrumental with uh, Ms. Linema in terms of a last minute request or two that we get, did get from the Housing Authority that CDBG was part of that. So um, we can't ask the consultant to completely rewrite this report, but as we do move forward, um, I would respectfully request that we um, not adopt those two particular points word for word from the consultant and we, we do rephrase them to properly reflect where we are right now. I'm not saying um, what was said in the past. I'm not going to, you know, judge on that. But um, it, it, and that's just, you know, n you know, not not a criticism. Just um, I understand where the comments came from. You know, perhaps two, three years ago. But um, uh, we are where we are right now. Um, and and again, I want to stress that the. Um, uh, Ms. Raid and Ms. Linema um, have been working with the Housing Authority um, in a more increased capacity as they've been appearing before us in, in, in different avenues that are afforded to them. So sorry, I didn't mean to go long in the tooth on that. I just wanted to um, raise that. And I know from working with both these women um, that, you know, they're, de they're definitely in agreement with that because, you know, we have been working with the Housing Authority and our colleagues on there and we'll continue to do that. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, and I also want to thank Ms. Raitt, Ms. Linema, and, and the entire the, the Housing Production Plan Implementation uh, Committee for all their work. There are 42, I believe, um, strategies that are, that, that are in, in, in the program, and, and uh, I think there's a lot of excellent ones. Um, I share Mr. Helmuth's concern about the first one, which is the, the allowing two-family homes and R0 and R1 as of right, as a, as a near-term goal. Um, and, and I think incremental um, change is good. But we, I talked to Ms. Wright about this earlier and shared some of my concerns. And, and where the ARB is going to be talking about this on Monday, and I know they voted to adopt this plan, but they, they, they also haven't taken a position on the, the Warren article to um, remove or, or to allow uh, two-family housings as, as of right in, in R0 and R1. And I'm having some difficulty just getting my arms around that in light of the report the ARB issued as part of the special town meeting in November 2020. Um, also following what's going on in Cambridge where the planning board um, has basically said the end of single-family zoning will take a long study to avoid a worse wealth gap. And it's a concern that the Cambridge is dealing with um, the city council is directing this. So I'm at a position where I, there's a lot of here that I agree with. There's a lot here that, that, that things are aspirational. I think it's, it's good to support. But for me, I'd, I'd like to hear from the ARB in terms of what they do on, on Monday night on this because I, I just feel like given where they were and, and given this as a, as a wholesale change um, and this, the fact that this is a five-year program, I'd like to see what they have to say yeah. to help me consider my vote here. And I know this is only one strategy out of 42, but it's the first strategy, and it's a near-term strategy. And I, I, I don't want to be in a position where I voted to adopt this, where, and then there's a subsequent vote on Monday night or get more information. And given where we are time frame wise I don't feel like a little extra time um, is going to make a difference in terms of when this gets approved and what the, what the impact is on um, on, on the plan being submitted and approved. So I, I, that's, what, that, that, that's where I am on this right now. Mr. Hurd? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what the what timeline is with the necessity of approving this. I'm happy to either withdraw or amend the motion if the board would feel more comfortable tabling this to another meeting. Um, the way I, I think, and I sort of touched on this, and I certainly have concerns as well. I didn't want to turn this into a hearing on single family zoning as a and I mean, I think we'll all have a chance to speak on that shortly. I mean, again, this is a set of guidelines, a set of goals, and I had viewed it as, you know, it's in there, and I think a lot of people have reservations, and we'll see what happens with town, ultimately, you know, We'll see how the ARB votes, but then ultimately we'll see how town meeting votes. And 
it will either be a goal that we had that didn't come to fruition or not. Um, I don't think if we town meeting votes it down again, I'm not sure we'll see it in the next five years. Maybe we will. But again, if the board would prefer to table this vote to a subsequent meeting, then I'm happy to amend my motion. I would second that amendment. Okay. Well, you don't want to. Once to table the the vote to adopt it. Okay, and put it on another agenda, and then right. go through all, all this again. Well, I no, not, not the public hearing process. Well, I I, I think we Monday night okay, we're well, going to hear fine. from the ARB on that's it. That's what you wanted. Okay, um, we got I, I I think the fact that the time frame is near term for this, and 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 where there is going to be a vote by the, the by the board that makes the recommendation to town meeting in less than a week mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's i tend to well you, you, I, I spoke before mr herdman's motion that i i certainly would support that and 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 again if this was a longer term goal that was in here i think i could probably get my arms around it to to to, to support it but I, th I think there needs to i think we need to hear from the arb um so any further comments mr diggins oh i mean so my understanding is that arb I mean, approved the plan, correct? They adopted the plan? They adopted the, the, the ARB plan? adopted the plan, if I may, um, Mr. Chair. Sure. The and, ARB adopted the plan at a meeting in January, yes. And this was and this was what's come before us on February 7th, right? Correct. So, so why is it that it didn't come to us at that point in time? Were we just busy? I mean, I was here. I'm they, trying they, to. They, think there were a number of requests, Mr. Diggins, and and we had agendas, and then there was issues with the consultant not being available. So there was delays due to our agenda, and then delays due to the, the availability of the consultant. The consultant was supposed, was supposed to be here at this meeting. No, at other meetings that we pushed this off. I see. I got it. And um, and and um, so let's say ARB votes down. Um the two family, um, the rezoning or, or allowing two families in one family, what then happens? I'm sorry? What happens if ARB me doesn't go along? That's another doesn't... piece of information for us. And we, this was presented to us and, and I asked this question when I was in the meetings and I was told, well, you don't necessarily, this is an aspirational document, so you don't necessarily have to agree with everything, okay? It's important for me to know what what IARB thinks on this in the short term where this is a near term goal. So it's a piece of information that I'll use and, and that may help my decision whether I, I move to make an amendment to this maybe or, or adopt it. It's five days away. I'd like to hear what they have to say. Mr. Hurd? Just a procedure, I, sorry. Okay, Mr. Diggins, did you want to say anything for that? I'm sorry, it's, it's responding to. No, I'm fine. I'm done. I'm done. Thanks. Sure. Just a procedural question. So if we make an amendment, since the ARB has already voted to approve and adopt this plan, if we make an amendment and we approve an amended version, does it have to go back to that? It has them to go for, back. Yeah. Uh, Attorney Hine? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The same plan has to be approved by the ARB and the select board. Otherwise, there will be a discrepancy in them, and you have to certify to the DHCD that this is essentially the same plan. And what are our time constraints? Well, Mr. Chair? Yes. I'll, I'll, if, if the plan director or the town manager may be aware of time constraints that I'm not aware of, but the idea is that you, you submit a plan, and while the plan is, if you don't have a plan in place, you don't have the safe harbor status that it can afford for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's probably the main concern. I, if I'm mistaken, uh, the manager or the director uh, can, can correct me. You correct as I understand of it, Mr. Castle. Yeah, so I get that. And I think we have somewhat of a foresight as to what potential 40B projects we have. And there's no unfriendly 40Bs down the pike that we would need that for so i mean again i'm fine pushing it off to whatever i want everyone on this board to be comfortable making a decision and i certainly think it would be in the best interest of the plan to have 
a unanimous vote if we get to that. And if that's what we need to do to get it right, then I'm happy to do that. Again, I just, I don't know that the way that the ARB will vote will determine my view on single family voting, whether they go it or not. I, we have our own views and we'll all express them if we choose to a town meeting, but I'm happy to vote to push it off. It doesn't seem like it's time critical to approve it today. Any, any further comments? Okay, so we have a motion to table by Mr. Hurd that was seconded <clears throat> by Mr. Helmuth. Um, Attorney Hine? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourse? Yes. Excuse Mr. Nemis vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is item five, review and discussion, Mass DHCD draft guidelines for MBTA communities. Jennifer Rate, Director, Department of Planning and Community Development, and Kelly Linema, Assistant Director, Department of Planning and Community Development. Ms. Rate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kelly is going to present, but I'm gonna give a little introduction first. So thank you again for having us here tonight. I'm Jennifer Raid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for Arlington. So we are gonna talk about MBTA communities, the zoning requirements, the eligibility, and what we understand based upon draft guidelines that we currently have from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Please uh, go ahead. Um, so the, I'm, I'm gonna, just one more slide, <laughs> sorry, Kelly. <laughs> We didn't practice. Um, so, the, uh, the the critical thing to understand is that we are we are presenting tonight because we have draft guidelines in place, and we also have some eligible uh, eligibility requirements that we have to meet, which includes this presentation to the board. Um, so, what Kelly is going to do is walk us through what it means to be el to remain eligible for certain types of funding, what we understand about those guidelines, and she's also going to share with us the different scenarios that we have explored if those draft guidelines were in place and those were the requirements that we had to comply with. Um, we intend to have a very public uh, community planning process once we actually know what the requirements are um, and to potentially engage some assistance with that process through uh, designers and other planners to assist the department and the redevelopment board um, in put it, putting together a thoughtful proposal that would ultimately have to be adopted by town meeting in the future. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly who will walk us through uh, the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to uh, members of the board. Um, Kelly Linema, Assistant Director of the Department of Planning and Community Development. As you can see here, this is the language from the 2021 legis Housing Choice Legislation. It is somewhat broad. Um, Basically just saying there needs to be one district of reasonable size within a half mile of a subway station or bus station. That is how is it applies to Arlington where multifamily housing is permitted as of right. And by family, they mean no age restrictions and it's gotta be suitable for families with children. Additionally, the legislation requires that these, this district, this multifamily zoning district be, um, have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre. And that means it's inclusive of streets, sidewalks, open space, et cetera. DHCD was given the mandate to come back with draft guidelines and guidance on how to, how these how this broader legislation could be interpreted. And so what they've done is established that a reasonable size to DHCD is a district that is at least 50 acres in total, where at least where uh, multifamily development, which counts as three or more residential units per per development, is allowed by right without age restrictions or bedroom limits. In Arlington, the number, um, they've also established a capacity threshold. And what that means is not on top, that's not a capacity for housing on top of what we already have. It's a capacity for housing as if there was nothing on the land right now. Um, and this is determined based on, for Arlington, because we are a rapid transit community, this is based on 25% of our total housing units. So in Arlington, this is, our district needs to allow for a capacity by right of multifamily housing for 5,115 units. And at least half of the land area of the district is within one half mile of the station. So what this also means is that 
so long as one half of 50 acres, one half, so 25 acres, as long as that is within the half mile radius of a station, the rest of the district can extend beyond that station. We'll get into that a little bit more in the scenarios. And by complying, that allows us to remain eligible for certain funding sources. By those funding sources, we're talking about MassWorks grants, which are a substantial funding source for communities all across the state. This is for design and construction of funding for public infrastructure. Um, we're also talking about a smaller pot of funding, but still important from Housing Choice Initiative, which allows for capital grants, um, updating master plan, planning studies, zoning amendments, that sort of thing. And Arlington doesn't qualify for a local capital projects fund. Um, primarily, this is really for communities that have gaming or casinos, and so we're not eligible for this fund. In the last five years, Arlington has not applied for or received MassWorks or Housing Choice Initiative funding. But I should note that we just completed a contract with, we just finished a contract with Stantec for the Mass Ave and Appleton project. And as part of their scope for this project, they're helping us to apply for a MassWorks grant in June. So it's really important that we maintain compliance with MBTA communities legislation so that we remain eligible for this funding source. Um, MassWorks, as I mentioned, is a large source with 1.1 million per on average for the 51 communities that they gave funds to last year. Um, we are not currently eligible for Housing Choice Initiative grants, but we could be in the next one to two years and have to answer questions about that. But I think most importantly is that the state could funnel more funding through these programs that are tied to incentive-based standards in the future. So we don't know what other sorts of funding sources are going to be tied to compliance with Housing Choice or with MBTA communities. When we look at whether Arlington complies now, uh, we really don't. So we, um, we don't have restrictions on family housing, um, but we also don't allow much by right. Um, nothing more than two units on a parcel, which is allowed in the R2 zone. Um, other, everything else has to be um, approved through a discretionary permit process. We also don't have a district of a reasonable size within a certain distance of an MBTA station or that capacity for 5,115 units. Although when you do look at the density in, Ar in Arlington, in East Arlington, we're not that far from that. So you can get kind of a picture of what a density of 15 units per acre looks like for context. Um, the timeline, um, if you have comments on the guidelines, which I know were submitted as part of your packet, those guidelines are due, those comments are due to DHCB tomorrow. So I'm glad we're able to get to this presentation today. Um, the next steps for us, as Jenny mentioned, we're giving this presentation to you, which allows us to submit a letter to DHCB um, stating that we are maintaining our compliance. And in December, then we need to notify them that we are not in compliant. Um, but what this does is it, it has us start to work on an action plan for maintaining compliance. And, the, and that action plan would be due about a year from now. And then in December of 2023, DHCD is requiring that we are implementing the action plan. Um, but this means that town meeting would need to adopt zoning bylaw amendments. And so again, as Jenny mentioned, there would be a public process as part of this, as part of developing the recommendations and the zoning amendments for town meeting. To submit your comments, you can do so at mass.gov slash MBTA communities. We are respectfully asking that you CC staff on any of these comments or provide us a copy of them. Um, as we're going to be working on this going forward, it's really helpful to know what people are saying um, so that we can we can work with the community and in, in, in development of plans that are community endorsed. Um, the final guidelines will be issued in the end of summer or early fall of 2022. And so until that point, we're sort of holding off. Uh, we're sort of we've done some test cases to understand size and scope, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but we're holding off on those until we receive those final guidelines to really understand what we need to comply with. Uh, some initial ideas for compliance, um, we could reduce the development subject to a special permit. So we could allow for three or more residential units in select areas, um, looking at specific districts. We could look at structures along or immediately behind Mass Avenue or thinking about allowing a little bit more by right in districts that are already higher density districts. Um, we also, as this is a recommendation of the housing plan and a recommendation of the net zero action plan is to create a large 40 yard district. Um, and we can get into more details on that if you have questions and allow um, two accessory dwelling units by right in single family zones. We did want to look at um, 
we wanted to provide the board with sort of a conceptual sense of what 50 acres looks like on the ground. And so again, this is very conceptual. These are not plans. This is just kind of trying to give you a sense of what is 50 acres and how much, how much acreage would we actually want to look at when we're thinking about that calculus of acreage versus density and number of units. So we looked at these three areas here, East Arlington, which is the one that everybody thinks about when they think about MBTA communities, because we are a rapid transit station, but also looking at Arlington Heights because the bus station with some minor amendments to the guidelines could actually be qualified as a station location. And we also included Arlington Center in this just so that we could get a sense of it's not, it's not compliant with the guidelines, but if we did want to extend a district in order to get more acreage to sort of think about what could that look like around the center. So just for a sense of how big is 50 acres. So in East Arlington here, this is about a 65 to 70 acre district where more than half of it is within that half mile radius. In Arlington Heights, um, this is looking at a really narrow strip of land that's within a half mile radius, almost entirely within a half mile radius of the bus station and then extends from the Lexington border um, almost halfway toward Arlington Center, between Arlington Center and Arlington Heights. One thing to note with those two prior examples is that those are pretty low sized districts and um, they may not, the town may wanna to consider doing something a little bit larger because we do need to have that capacity for 5,115 units. So that capacity in that area may not be suitable based on what residents are looking for. Um, and so we also just looked at what if we did something around each of our three business districts. Um, one of the things that the guidelines do allow for is for multifamily, or sorry, for mixed use development. So we can include site plan review and encourage mixed use development with commercial on the ground floor. So we may want to think about how this contributes to our economic development um, potential in town. We also can put affordability requirements as part of the zoning. And so that's definitely something we would want to talk about with the community. And then our final example here, which is you're seeing here is a, a district that could be between 200 and 450 acres, which does bring us down to if you if you had 15 acres per unit, um, that that district size would get a, if we had 15 acres per unit by right, this would this would basically be the size of that the, the middle strip here, um, but you could consider doing an overlay, which would be a set distance from the mass Ave border. I'm going to hand this back over to Jenny, but again, we're here to answer any questions you might have and we'll keep you informed as we move forward with this process. Kelly. Go ahead, Ms. Wright. Yep, thank you. Um, just one, one quick note on Kelly's, uh, the scenarios that we shared that were for illustrative purposes only and for this, the purposes of this discussion. Um, we picked up the bus depot, as you may have seen, that is also not known whether or not that is actually an eligible location. Um, it may or may not be, and the guidelines are a little unclear about that. So I just want to make it clear that we're, we're these are all exploratory and for discussion only. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. And, and just for purposes of the presentation, I know we have to receive the presentation. You mentioned the deadline for submitting comments and, and the fact that the final guidelines will be issued later, end of summer or September time period, is that? Okay, yes, you know, so, so for tonight's purposes, we can have a discussion, but you're looking for us just to receive this report and, and, and offer any comments, is that? We are just, yeah, looking to have a discussion with you. We, you can just accept the report and the conversation, but uh, there is nothing for you to act upon tonight. Um, as Kelly was suggesting, uh, the deadline for comments to the Department of Housing and Community Development for anybody who wishes to comment is by tomorrow, March 31st. Um, and that, of course, could include the board. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All right, I'll turn to the board. Uh, Mr. Hurd? I'll move receipt. Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Any further comments? Uh, Mr. Helm? Oh, go, oh, go ahead, Mrs. Mahan. Just um, really not to get into a discussion about it tonight because as the chair and Ms. Ray just pointed out, we're in the infancy of this process um, and we really don't know what it is. I just do want to raise um, my concerns when I first look at this, um, especially for East Arlington and the, the current MUGAR uh, pro process that we're going through, um, this 
the way you look at it could sort of fly, fly in the face of that or fly against um, uh, the prevailing um, idea for, for that area down there. But having said that, um, until we know exactly what the uh, guidelines are, what does, um, what is eligible and, and, and can be approved. And then if, especially, I mean, basically there's really just two places I can think of in Arlington, as you pointed out, the bus station and Al Wife. Um, and we, Al Wife is certainly um, <clears throat> taking the oak tree development out of it, really better <coughs> assault with the uh, Cambridge side uh, development of it. But I'm getting ahead of, uh, the actual conversation because I don't know what the parameters or the matrix of actually what the guidelines are, what it is the town or municipality needs to fulfill and agree to, but also on the on the converse, what that um, opens that area of that town to in order to accept the funds. So I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, initiate the process. I do have some concerns going in, but I don't think they're valid right now because um, None of us knows exactly what the actual legal framework is. I just wanted to put that out there, um, which I know you're already, you already have an eye towards looking at that anyways. It's not like I'm the only person who's come up with that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Just, just quickly, I wanted to express my appreciation for the quality of this presentation. Uh, even though, as, as my colleague Ms. Mahan said, you know, we don't know what the guidelines look like, it's really helpful to start, it helped me understand what this could look like, what kinds of decisions that we in town meeting may have to make and what some opportunities there are. There's a lot of information crammed into a very short presentation, but the videos <coughs> were great, and um, just credit where that's due. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Diggins? <coughs> yes, I, I was uh, part of a, a meeting, meeting with the MTA Advisory Board, you know, and we talked about this you know, uh, it was yesterday. You know, and and um, the state is really committed to helping communities work um, um, with you know, this um, this HCA, and you know, uh, this is all part of the um, Housing Communities Act, you know, 2021. Uh, and, and so uh, they are going to really help communities develop the, an action plan. At least that's the current plan with the current administration. We, into all of this, we, we toss in we, you know, a gubernatorial election, but hopefully I mean, the next administration will stick with um, this plan because I mean, the whole point of it is to create more housing. I mean, the, the state is committed to that. It realizes the importance of it. I mean, and it realizes also that different communities are gonna have um, different needs, uh, but, but the goal is to help the communities as much as possible work through this process. Great. Thank you. Th th thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, and I also want to thank you both for the presentation and, and for the materials, just where we are relative to the draft guidelines and, and where we're going forward. So appreciate the presentation and for you sticking around uh, with us tonight. I know Monday night you had a late night too, probably with the uh, ARB meeting. So thank you, thank you both very much. Um, so on a motion uh, for receipt by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, uh, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank Mr. you. Mr. Corsi? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Sure. Okay. So the, the, the good news for the board, we're, we're moving on to Warren article hearings. Um, however, the, the, the good news is that what we did the other night because of timing on the agenda, we put all of the articles that were scheduled to be heard on Monday because we didn't know what we were going to get through. We have completed just about all of them. So as I go through this, um, I think we can move through these pretty rapidly. The first two, um, the first one, Article 21, this, this was related to Mr. Diggins, um, well, what was presented the other night on Article 7, and if town meeting votes approval of the study commission, this one will not be necessary. So we were uh, advised by Attorney Heim to vote a will report on Article 21 because we will wait to see what town meeting does. I think that's what we talked about Attorney Heim, is that? I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I actually think that you could vote no action. You've, okay. got, you've got a recommendation of action on the other article. That article also contains the language or take any action related thereto. If for some reason town meeting wanted to extend the life of the committee, I think it probably could under that article if it was really desperately necessary. Um, or, you know, we could try to revisit 
the um, Article 24. So I think with the explanation in the comment that the only reason you're not recommending action is because you've received a recommendation, is that is that fair to say, Mr. Diggins? I know that you've done a tremendous amount of work with this. That, that yeah, I mean, it's fair to say, I mean, that was my understanding too, but I wasn't going to uh, try to play town council. So I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, okay, okay. So all right, so I'll, Mr. Hurd? Vote no action on Article 21. Okay. Second. Okay. And we had extensive public comment the other night on Article 7, so I'm not going to, I don't think there's anybody on the list for this <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so on a motion of no action by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay, great. Thank you. Article 24, now this is one that we... Um, in talking to the town manager, we also have had some discussions with the chair of the finance committee. Um, the finance committee wanted to have some, uh, share their thoughts on this with us, and I, um, we couldn't arrange times to do that because of the way the schedules worked on, on their meetings and our meetings. And so what we agreed to do is we will uh, hold off on this until we get that feedback out of fairness to them. Um, and so what I suggest, if, if the board is, is willing, is that we would put a uh, will report in, in, in our select board report and see if we can get this done between now and town meeting. So, so Okay, motion by Mrs. Second. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any questions, comments? Okay. Um, Attorney Hahn? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Um, see how quickly we're moving through this. Article 23. Mr. Chair. This is a vote on the Board of Youth Services. Um, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to report on this water code that I think the right posture is to take a recommended vote of no action, not because the Board of Youth Services is not interested in updating portions of its uh, essentially charter, if you will, but because researching the creation of the Board of Youth Services and its uh, operative uh, guidelines has been a little bit trickier than a lot of folks anticipated. It was originally created in 1962, I think, <laughs> and then uh, it was a little bit hard to track down some later votes that amended it. So I think this is the type of thing where uh, if the board is okay with it, the request is for no action at this time and that they'll come back to uh, the next uh, annual or special town meeting, whichever occurs sooner, to revisit this. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Vote no action on, I move no action on Article 23. A second? Second. Okay, second by Mr. Helmuth. Any comments, questions from board members? Seeing none, I, nobody is on the list. So on a motion of no action by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. No. I'm sorry, yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, yes. Mrs. Mahan. <laughs> Thanks for waking me up, Mr. Diggins. Yes. <laughs> Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Okay. And the last one, we have done all the others. The last one this evening is Article 47. I believe that's the endorsement of parking benefit district expenditures. Is, is that ready tonight, Mr. Chapterlain? It is. And if the board, uh, if it pleases the board, I can quickly share my screen, give a brief overview, and then answer any questions the board might have. Sure. Let me... Okay, can, can you all see that spreadsheet? The larger, please. <laughs> yeah. It's a little tough. Yeah. Is it tough? Okay. I that, just no, had that's an okay. eye exam this it, week, it but looks, I, I, they didn't. It's clear to me, so I'm glad it's I. Uh, black I'm glad and white, I, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's better. So, all right, let me just move, let me move my screen around here. So let me focus in on can you see my cursor here? Yeah. I want to focus in on what we're asking the board. This is the total parking package that we bring to the finance committee and then will be contained within, I think, both the boards and the finance committee's reports. But after meeting several times with the parking advisory committee, um, we came together with a list of proposals for the FY23 parking benefit district expenditures that we'd like approval for. Uh, the past couple of years with the pandemic, revenue has been down and because of revenue being down, we have not expended very much from, uh, you know, toward the parking benefit district. In fact, we we only project to spend in this current fiscal year $20,000 towards the seasonal planters in the center. However, because we haven't spent money and we had collected significant amount of revenue before the pandemic, we do have a balance of $427,000 in the parking fund, which allows us in FY23 
to make this request of $200,000 for the parking benefit district. So the first item you see are is the Chestnut Street safety improvements in the amount of $50,000. This is directly related to the approval of the board back at its meeting in February 23rd to expand the parking benefit district to Chestnut Street so that the improvements improvements that were recommended by TAC and then are now being further designed by Stantec that these monies can go towards that actual implementation. The next item is for the Russell Common lot in the amount of $65,000. That lot has long been of interest to those serving on the Parking Advisory Committee and also members of the Chamber of Commerce for some landscape beautification and lighting improvements and we'd like to put this $65,000 amount towards that. We'd like to continue the seasonal planting amount in the amount of $20,000 and actually that first planting this season will go in next week. Next, we'd like to replace the sidewalk on Old Mystic Street. Um, you all probably know what this is, but in case you don't, that's that pedestrian walkway in between Whittemore Park and the commercial buildings that Wooden Strings is in um, facing on Mass Ave. It hadn't been included as part of the Arlington Center sidewalk replacement, uh, so it is still aging brick and we'd like to make it consistent with the rest uh, of the center sidewalk and fund it out of this parking benefit district account. And then finally, uh, the railroad lot blue bike station. Uh, we have moved it from the sidewalk where it was placed, but we want to make sure and put an investment in keeping it in the parking lot where it's currently located, but doing so in a fashion uh, that will keep it off the ground and let snow operations and snow clearing happen while it is in place so that it can be operable year round. So we don't exactly know what it will cost, but we'd like to put at least $25,000 towards that um, to improve that site and make it operable year round for blue bike users. So that adds up to a total of $200,000 for the parking benefit district. Would uh, very much like your favorable action on it, but be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Chapterlin. Uh, questions, uh, Mr. Hurd? I'll move positive action. Okay. And as a member of the parking advisory committee, I keep, I keep forgetting the name of the, of the committee I serve on. Um, we, we went through a number of options as to how to spend the money this year. And really the theme, I think, as you could tell, is kind of helping rejuvenate the Arlington Center District. And we've done a few walkthroughs of the Russell Commons lot. And I think when you drive by, it, it doesn't seem so bad when you walk through there's a lot to point out and a lot to work on. And those were kind of the key points that we were trying to, to accomplish with the request this year is to try to, you know, we're getting through the tail end of the utility work in Arlington Center and we can start the revitalization of Broadway Plaza and to put some of this money into the surrounding areas so we have a complete product to start to fill some of the businesses that we, ha that we lost in the past couple of years and rejuvenate that one particular district. And I think with these requests, we're going a long way towards achieving that goal. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, do we have a second? Uh, second that, and you know, and I'm glad Mr. Hurd explained that because we, we hear a lot from residents who understandably are frustrated with the vacant storefronts. And you know, there are a lot of, it's a complex issue. Um, but I think it's important just for the public to understand that the town really has that on our radar and that this is a really good example of one thing that we're doing that will help. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Any further comments? Um, Mr. Dickens? Thanks for replacing the, the old brick sidewalk. <laughs> for, God, it's dangerous. That's right. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody on the list? Seeing none. Seeing none. Okay, so on a motion for favorable action by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Ma? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. yes. Let's vote. Okay, so that concludes our Warren article hearings. Final votes and comments, it, it looks like a long list, but again, I, I believe the only ones on tonight are going to be Article 8 and Article 19. We've already voted on Article 6, Article 9, Article 17, Article 20, Article 22, Article 26, Article 73. And I just wanna check with Attorney Heim, I think we voted Article 25 as well. I believe so. Okay. Which I, Sorry. That, that, yeah, that was one open one. There are a few here that we don't have back tonight. Yes. Okay, good. Um, because they were just heard on Monday or they're not quite ready 
because the um, the tape from our last meeting is still not available. Yeah, um, that's correct. Okay. All right. So let's move to our and these were two that were held from the um, from the last meeting, Articles Eight and Nineteen. So we'll go to Article Eight, and I think there were a couple of proposed changes. Um, so I don't know. I think those have been circulated to board members. Um, so if anybody wants to make a motion on that or to have any comments. Mr. Chair, would you like to, me to speak to mine? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, so my, my suggestion is, is really just a clarification. Um, uh, under the Section 3, uh, Subsection A, under the appointment of the Commission, I'm suggesting that um, Item 5, one member nominated by the Envision Arlington Diversity Task Group co-chairs, and then we add the words with the, with the approval of the Envision Arlington Standing Committee. Uh, the reason for that being that the diversity task group does not have a formal me uh, membership. Anybody can show up. They don't, they're not appointed. There's no appointment process. So I think that if the standing committee has the ultimate vote, that's, that's helpful to them um, as well. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And Mr. Diggins, I believe you had an additional an insert on the comments for this, if you want yes. to speak to that. Sure. It was just to reflect me, well, me what happened in the meeting. I mean, we, we did meet. Uh, amend you know the recommendation of the uh, study committee I mean to allow for law enforcement the retired law enforcement that are not from Arlington I mean, to be eligible I mean and so I, I think that it should just the record the comments should just reflect what happened so I hope that was just neutral I mean it just kind of stated what happened uh, that there was a vote I mean and and, and the, the, the record of the vote and, and left it at that. No, I, I didn't add any editorial, I didn't editori editorialize it all. So I hope that's acceptable. Okay, thank you. So on, on both of those, if we if uh, anybody wants to make a motion on that for, for final vote. Move approval. Okay, second. A second. Okay, uh, a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Uh, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Okay. Mr. DeCourcy, I'm sorry, may I? Y yes, go ahead, turn. I think you're, you're going to add one more. Mrs. Marr actually is yeah. the one who caught it. I'm going to give her credit. I think it's Article 12. That's right. I was just, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Marr, for that. No yeah. Article 12, the bylaw amendment for single use plastic water bottle regulation. That one we have not voted. Attorney Heim did circulate that. So, um, to the board for any motion or comments. Move approval on that. Okay. Do a second. Second. Okay. Questions, comments? Seeing none, on a um, motion for approval by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. And the last one this evening, this was a hold. On Article 19, I believe Mr. Diggins had asked for a hold on it. I don't know if there's any proposed changes. Well, yes, me. So this is one where I was, I'm, I'm seriously I'm contemplating changing uh, my vote to no action. Because uh, I, I, in the discussion, I didn't want it to be a, a back and forth. It was, it was late, of course, you know, or at least it was looking like it was going to be a late evening. And I do understand I mean, the, um, that there has been, uh, I think, a, a good precedence of having these things done by at least another committee. I mean, the, and I think the one um, stated is the, um, the um, uh, uh, not cemetery committee, but the um, public, public memorials. memorials. Thank you, public memorials committee. Thank you. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, I mean, I'm inclined to let that happen uh, because I, mean, I, I could easily imagine a situation where, I mean, if we were brought a number of these, I mean, we would want something like the Public Memorials Committee you know, to exist, I me, mean, so that there could be some standard way of dealing with this. I mean, uh, I mean the, the way things happen, I, mean, I understood the argument then at the time you know and i just want to give maybe a little more information than is necessary but the sequence of the vote just made it hard for me um uh not to at least vote positive action on it i mean we 
Mr. Hurd had made the motion and I seconded it indeed. And so when the vote came, the sequence of the vote, we I mean, kind of, uh, by coincidence, was that me and Mr. Hurd went first and, and I went second. And, and I was just couldn't really vote against it, having seconded it, although I understood the argument for uh, no action. I, mean, I would hope, though, that I mean, in the process of the memorial committee um, hearing this, that they would entertain uh, Mr. Schlichtman's request, meaning that he could take it um, to them and make his case for it. You know, so uh, with that hope, you know, and perhaps Mr. Heim can tell me if that is part of the process, maybe, you know, I'd be happy to change my vote to no action. I, I, I was just going to turn to Attorney Heim, because this is one of those rare instances where it was a three to two vote. So. Uh, if Mr. Diggins were to change his vote, it would change the outcome of the recommendation. But if you could talk to us about the procedure for that. Uh, there's no formal requirement for you guys to have a hearing on this kind of thing. If you want to change your votes, you can change your votes and the quantum of your vote. Um, that's up to the board whether, A, you want to entertain a change to a previously uh, registered vote of the board at this point in time on something that is not legally required. It's not like, I, I know we call them hearings. Uh, but they're not ARB hearings, which are required under Chapter 40A. So if the board wants to change its, 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 its vote, I, it's really up to you to decide how much process you want to afford that, whether you want to consider reopening the hearing or whether you want to um, just flip the vote now based on uh, what your discussion has been. Um, it's, it's entirely up to the board's discretion in terms of how it wants to handle this specific situation. It's not usually you would have like a sort of motion for reconsideration first um, if you wanted to add a little bit of formality to it, it would be you know will we will the board allow reconsideration of the article and then secondly will the board vote again it also might give an opportunity to mr. Hurd and mr. Helmuth if they want to stick to their guns or they want to change their position um, you know so I would guess my recommendation would be first take a vote to re whether or not you'll reconsider uh, the previous action and then secondly um, take a take a fresh vote, and I understand that we haven't posted it as a Warren article hearing, but it is a vote and comment. Right. Um, so that, okay. that's that's my perspective. All right, thank you. I, no, I, I think that's appropriate to Mr. Diggins. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. DeCourcy, I, I know that Mrs. Mahan may have been the only person here who's experienced this before. I don't know if there's been a precedent in the vice chair's experience. I have not seen a change of vote that would actually change the outcome, which is a new situation as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think I, 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 I had it when I first joined the board, but because I wasn't at the hearing, there was just a comment that had I voted, the board's outcome would have been different, but, but we said, you know, we put a, a, a stop at the, at the election, but that's, that's the only thing. I, I don't know, Ms. Mahan, it's do you have anything? It's never happened before. So. Okay. okay, I just okay. wanted to confirm that and respect that if, if yeah. the board has had a past practice on this, I'm not aware of it. Okay, all right, so Mr. Diggins, would you like to bring a motion for reconsideration? Uh, sure, sure, but, but just a, just a quick question about the the, um, the public memorial committee. So, would Mr. Would Mr. Schlickman be able to make his case um, to them? Do you know, Mr. Heim? Yes, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes, go, uh, go right ahead. Yes, Mr. Schlickman doesn't need to go to town meeting to achieve this goal. I think we all agree on that. It was right. just a little bit ambiguous as to whether or not town meeting could, uh, you know. Uh, take a vote on this so he would be able to take it to the public memorials committee which would make a recommendation to this board and this board would vote on whether or not they agree with the public uh, the public memorials committee and either name it after him or not or after the Magliozis or not if that answers your question Mr. Diggins yeah, thought, thank you Mr. Uh, Mr. Hunt and I should have just said yes or no sorry okay and Mr. Chapterlin I think wanted to provide an answer as well Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just not to uh, put too fine a point on it, but I think practice has been for this board to make referrals to the Public Memorials Committee and not for them to necessarily directly receive requests from residents. So that I, I don't mean to split hairs too much, but I think this board could certainly forward their request to the Public Memorials Consideration. Fair point. Okay. Consideration. Thank you. Okay. So did, did you, you made the motion, Mr. Diggins, is that, or, or maybe you haven't made it yet. Yeah, I asked if you want to make it. I mean, so I'd like to make a motion for to reconsider you know, my vote in, on um, Article 19. Okay, and do we have a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Um, we'll, well, comment before Mr. Hurd. I, 
I don't want to make a comment that would be longer than a vote. I just, I didn't know we had a motion for reconsideration. I thought we would just re-vote it in final votes and comments well, be, with a new vote, but whatever we got okay. to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well that. that we, we, we all know what the goal is. And then we'll have what the, the no, Well, we'll have the vote is. on reconsideration. Yeah. If then that's a, a, a favorable vote, then we will re-vote re the article. Okay. So on a, a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mrs. Mahan for reconsideration, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Okay. So unanimous vote. The matter is before you for reconsideration. Okay. And, and Mr. Diggins, if you'd like to bring a motion on the article now. Right. So, so the motion would be no action on article. Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes, Dean. So okay. I'd like to make a motion for no action on Article 19. Okay. Do a second? Second. Okay. Um, Mr. Hellman? Yeah. So for me, this is not a clear cut thing. So you know, I'm fine with how, how this goes. Um, I think I'm going to stay with my original vote um, just, just because my belief is that the, this is a novel situation um, and that the best, uh, a better avenue would be uh, the town meeting route rather than the Public Memorials Committee. But, you know. Not, not a hill I'm going to die on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, I guess I would just say that uh, it's such a unique situation that Mr. Schlickman found an unnamed stretch of roadway. So I don't anticipate, you know, people coming out of the woodwork to <laughs> rename the multitude of unnamed roadways that we have in town. So I'll stick with my original vote, too, as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So on a, a motion for no action by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? No. <laughs> Mr. Diggins. I have to think about that one. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Helmuth? No. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. All right. The vote is three to two carries for no action. Um, I will draft a comment that is consistent <laughs> with much of this, but refers it to, that, that recommends referral to the Public Memorials Committee. Is that okay? Th thank you, Attorney Hein. Yes. History is made. Okay. Um, all right, so that concludes the final votes for tonight. There will be a few that we will address at the next meeting. Um, next item, item seven, correspondence received, request for memorial for Julia Miller. Before we, I ask for a board vote, I think, uh, Mr. Chapter, I believe we discussed this. I think your recommendation would be a referral to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Is that? That is correct, and they are expecting it. Okay. All right. Um, so, if I have a motion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a lovely idea. And move receipt and referral to the Parks and Recreation Committee. Okay, thank second. you. Second. And second by Mr. Hurd. Okay. Um, so, on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Hines. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mon? Yes. Mr. DeCourse? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay. Uh, new business. Uh, Ms. Mar? Attorney Hines? We have a single special town meeting warrant article for your consideration. It's an eminent domain taking for safe route schools, which means that it shouldn't clog up uh, your calendar too much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and while he isn't here, I'm going to turn to Mr. Chapter Lane across the room for any uh, new business. No new business tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Helmet? Nothing for me. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? <clears throat> Just one thing, um, and I discussed this with Attorney Heim and the chair um, really briefly, but. Um, there's a, a meeting tomorrow um, that it's my understanding the town manager and uh, attorney Heim will be attending with the MWRA. Uh, it's a meeting that, um, which I'm really excited about this news that the Save the Owl Life um, now has not only the Mystic River watershed um, joining in that effort, but the Charles River watershed um, regarding the CSO discharge and the Owl Life. Um, so uh, there's already been a pre-planning meeting before that, which was very, very positive. Um, but there'll be meeting tomorrow. It, and what I wanted to bring to my colleagues' attention, which we're all aware of, that um, April 1st is the deadline for the CSO permittees who currently are permitted to discharge CSOs into the LWIFE being the MWRA, the cities of Cambridge and Somerville, they have to submit um, to uh, DEP and EPA. It, 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 yes. Right. Yeah. Um, the, their plan for 
how they're going to address that, if they're going to continue doing that, if there's um, an alternative plan, an A and a B. Uh, the good thing is the Save the Owl Wife, Mystic River Watershed, and Charles River Watershed did already submit a letter, their own testimony to the April 1st deadline to the DEP and the EPA saying that this practice has to stop and, and stands unified in that. And so um, I know either at the next select board meeting or perhaps, I don't know, if and when we may have an executive session on this, will be you know brought up to speed again we're in the beginning of this um as well as uh, um the chair and i have asked the town manager and, and town council after april 1st and dep and epa gather their required remarks from cambridge Somerville, mwra they'll come out with their own sort of draft report can can you am i saying anything incorrect no no okay and um once that happens, um, that the, the town manager, Attorney Heim, will get that back to all of us and we'll be embark on this. And this is separate from the NIPTES permit process, which is also coming up. So I just think that's good news. I was so excited that, you know, it's definitely spreading. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Martin. Mr. Diggins? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so uh, uh, just a quick uh, couple things. And the um, Civic Engagement Group is, is having a forum on the annual town surveys. And by that, I mean the, the past survey uh, review of that one, the one from 2021, uh, a discussion about the current survey and an early discussion about the um, 2023 survey. And uh, also this, um, the current survey, the deadline has been extended to May 1st. And finally, I'm wearing my heart tie and I don't do that just any time. It's because it's your last meeting. It's your last meeting. It's your last meeting, Mr. Chair. And so um, it's been great and, um, and appreciate the great job you've done. You really did a wonderful job keeping at least me informed of what's going on. And, and, and I appreciate your patience and your leadership over the last year. And it was great that you're gonna be back. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Here, here. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I just wanted to say after a long string of 11 o'clock end time meetings, I always look forward to the meetings that fall the end of that, the conclusion of Warren article hearings. So, and then thank you for your leadership this year. And I just wanted to let you know, though I haven't made a decision, I'm strongly considering voting for you on Saturday. Thank you. I appreciate the consideration. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And, and I, I want to thank everybody. This is, this is my last uh, meeting as chair. I want to thank Ms. Maher, Ms. Costa, and Mrs. Kropelka for all the support that they've uh, given me the, the past year and, and, and the direction on, on different things. I want to thank Attorney Heim. We worked very closely on a number of uh, items um, throughout the year. I want to thank Mr. Chapdelaine uh, as well. We, did, we had a lot of contact throughout the past year with meetings. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for all your support. Made my job a lot easier. First time I had done it, and, and I really appreciate everybody's support and, and the collegiality. So, um, with that, I will take a uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Um, second. Second. Okay. So, motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. I don't to get too excited about that. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, sir. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>